There we go. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna drop just the link to the slides uh, in the chat here if you wanna follow along. They are all online. And I will share my screen. Okay, so uh, today what we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be talking about uh, data wrangling. If you were at the last one, I guess, can I get a show of hands, maybe how many people were at the, uh, the last uh, data wrangling session? All right, a few of you. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, uh, so we're gonna be doing data wrangling again. If you were at the last one, you'll recognize some of the material from before, same conceptual material, but we're gonna be doing it uh, with data table. So uh, we're gonna be going through what the goal of data wrangling is. We're gonna talk about how to think about how to do data wrangling and put it all together. Uh, we're gonna talk about some technical tips and all those technical tips are gonna be uh, in the form of the data table package. And then we'll work on a, a walkthrough example. Um, so uh, uh, one thing, the things I'm going to focus on and not focus on in this workshop, uh, uh, we're going to talk about, I mean, we're going to talk a lot about the concepts behind data wrangling, what you should be trying to do. A lot of the problems that I see people having with data wrangling have more to do with what they are trying to do than trying to get technical code uh, correct, although that is, of course, important as well. Uh, but what I'm going to focus on, especially for technical skills, is letting you know what's out there and sort of what the right tool is for the job. Uh, these very specifics of using those tools, uh, I will leave to you a little bit, partially because I don't expect you to remember. If I just tell you, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, now I remember all the syntax exactly. You're going to need to look up the help file anyway. Uh, so we're going to go through some basic examples of how to use these tools, but we're not going to get super far in the weeds on each of them, uh, especially when it comes to computer skills. My real comparative advantage is in knowing what's out there and letting you know what's out there so you know what to look for. Uh, and if you really want to learn it and get it internal to you, you're going to have to practice it. Uh, really the best uh, advice that I can offer, especially for data wrangling, even more than actually analyzing data, uh, is to give yourself a project and do it. And the first time you do it is going to be terrible. You're going to hate it. It's going to take you way longer than it should. Uh, you're going to spend hours agonizing over one line of code that you don't understand why it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, but by the end of it, you'll be a lot stronger of a uh, data manipulator. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about data table and why uh, we're in, why I'm basically doing the same workshop as last time, but with data table instead of the tidyverse. Uh, so um, pr I'm pretty sure that all, in most, if not all of the R classes you're going to get at CLU and a lot of the R material out there in the world is about the tidyverse. Uh, so the tidyverse is, of course, a collection of packages uh, spearheaded by Hadley Wickham, uh, and it has a lot of stuff in it. And one of those is, uh, is the dplyr package, which is used for data manipulation. Um, so tidyverse is great. I use Tidyverse a lot. I certainly got started in R uh, in the Tidyverse. Uh, however, data table, it, the Tidyverse really ceases to be the right tool for the job once you start getting into large data sets. Uh, data table is just significantly faster uh, than the Tidyverse by a pretty wide margin. Uh, it's also faster than most other options as well. It is in, it, for, for a lot of uh, cases, it is faster than Pandas and Python. Uh, I mean, if you want to go real speedy, you know, you're going to be working in C or something like that. Uh, or even Julia uh, is a good one for, for really speedy stuff. But uh, if, you're, if you're sticking to packages that have a lot of well-supported analytical tools, uh, then really uh, data table is about as fast as it can get. It's also very good at handling very big data sets. Uh, if you are going to be working with data that you're going to hold in memory, then data table is really the best option for that. What I mean by hold in memory is sometimes when you're working in data, you're working with a database where the database sits on a hard drive somewhere and you send the calculation out to it, the calculation gets done and it sends you back the result. You never load the data set. Uh, however, a lot of anal analysis works with you loading the data set as though you were opening up an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, if you're going to do that, there is basically no faster option than data table with very few exceptions, right? So if you're going to do SQL, great, that's one thing. If you're going to load up the data set into memory, data table is probably your best option. Let me give you a quick uh, example of just how fast it is. Um, so uh, ooh, didn't want that. Okay, so uh, I, I just wrote this code in the five minutes before we started. Uh, so it's not exactly optimized, but what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to restart R, so you know I'm starting from fresh. I guess I already did that. Okay, so what do I have here? Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little timed session here. Uh, it's going to time how long it takes, a very simple timer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read in this data set or this data set right here, which has 18 million observations in it. This test data right here has 18 million observations. 
It's fairly large. It's just a CSV file. It's not even stored efficiently. Uh, I'm going to take this 18 million line data set. I'm going to merge it with another data set. Uh, I'm going to sort it. I'm going to do a calculation. I'm going to add a new column to it. Uh, I'm going to do a grouped operation where I'm going to go brand by brand. I'm going to calculate their growth rate uh, in each period. Then I'm going to select the best growth rate and see what day it is. Uh, and then I'm going to, that's it. So I'm loading this, this data set. I'm doing a merge, which often takes a lot of time. I'm doing a column operation. Uh, I'm doing a grouped operation, which has to sort the data, group the data, do the calculation for each group, uh, and then report the result. And we're going to see how long uh, this takes to do. So let me just start that. It's also loading the, the, the package itself as well while it does this. All right, so all that stuff took six and a half seconds. Uh, so that's great, and it, it did it all. Uh, I'm gonna restart R again. I'm gonna clear this out. I'm gonna do a second time test, and this time I'm not gonna do any of that stuff. I'm just gonna load the tidyverse package. Okay, that took two seconds. So about a third of the time just to load the package as opposed to do all that stuff. If I tried to write this code, by the way, in the tidyverse, it would take a long, long time. The tidyverse has a lot of trouble, say, reading in an 18 million line data set. Uh, so uh, there's, there's a pretty big difference. And, and for some operations, it can really be 10 to even 100 times faster to use data table as opposed to the tidyverse. So hopefully you're convinced that it's worth learning. Uh, this is what I use most of the time is, is data table at this point. Um, I will be using one tool from the tidyverse, which is the pipe. Uh, so it looks like this. Uh, and if you're not familiar with it, it's a very handy tool for making your code look a lot more, a more, a lot more readable. Uh, all that it does is it says, take whatever's on the left of this and make it the first argument of the function on the right. Uh, this can be very handy for chaining together your code, making things more readable. Um, I do like it. Uh, as a tool, I use it even when I'm working with data table. Uh, you can load it without the tidyverse itself by uh, using the magritar package or a number of other packages in the tidyverse will come with the pipe in them. Uh, excuse me. Um, and also, uh, right now, R is on version 4.03, I think. Uh, once it updates to 4.1, uh, they will have a pipe in base R, and you won't need to load a package to get a pipe anymore. It won't look like this. It'll be uh, like that. That'll be the new pipe once 4.1 comes out. All right, so I will be using the pipe. Uh, here's how it works. Uh, so uh, you take this big old nested ugly function here. So what am I doing with this? I'm looking in the MT cars data set. I'm getting the AM variable. I'm going to take the mean of that variable, setting, uh, dropping any missing observations. And then I'm going to format it as a percentage. OK? Uh, I can rewrite this thing. It's got a bunch of nested parentheses. It's easy to mess up one of the parentheses. Instead, I'll just write it like this. I'll take MT cars. I will pass it with the pipe to make it the first argument of the next function. Uh, so here's a function that I'm using, this little double uh, 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 bracket here. That is the uh, list selector function. So if I take this data set here, right, I can do D dollar sign. Oops. So I can do D dollar sign to pick a variable, right? So I can also pick a variable like this. Right? That's more similar to how you might do it in most other programming languages. right? Um, and so this double bracket right here, that's a function. That is a function that selects an, ob an object from, uh, 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 an object from, a, from a list. So I can use that function. I can say, hey, see those little back ticks? That basically says, hey, treat this as a, spe as a special object. Right? It's the same result here. I'm just taking these double brackets. Anyway, the point of that is that it makes it easier to work with the pipe with that. Uh, so I'm just picking a variable out of there. I'm then going to take the mean of that variable, setting the missings, uh, dropping any missings. Uh, you can notice here the mean function takes two arguments. The first one is the variable itself, which I am passing in. The pipe makes it the first argument of the mean function. And then the missing uh, missing data thing, which is the second argument, which I can just put it right, put it right in here. It still works. Then I'm going to pass that whole thing uh, with the pipe to the percent function. Uh, which I will then scale it to a percentage with a, a one decimal after the place. So it sort of works like a conveyor belt. You're taking each object and you're passing it through functions in successive order. Uh, and as I mentioned in R4.1, uh, they will change. They will add a pipe to base R, and you won't need to load the tidyverse version anymore. It's also worth noting, uh, as, as you'll see as we get more into data table, you can chain operations just using data table itself. 
Uh, I don't actually often use that tool for for because I usually use in place operations, which we'll get to. All right. Uh, all right. So before we get right uh, get into the data wrangling stuff, do interrupt me at any time. Uh, I don't see the chat right now. Um, it often goes off screen. If anybody is putting something in the chat and I don't see it, uh, just let me know. Um, I will try to. Oops, not that. There we go. Okay. So data wrangling. What is data wrangling? Uh, you have some data. Uh, however, it is not yet ready to run your model or your analysis. That's what we want to do with the data after all. Uh, and you have to get it from point A to point B. Uh, and all of those processes are data wrangling. That's what we're going to be doing. Uh, so some tips just generally for data wrangling. Again, these have nothing to do with any sort of technical skill. They are just things you want to keep in mind and do as you go through any sort of data wrangling process. Uh, whatever language or code or even Excel or whatever you're using. Uh, so tip number one, always look directly at your data. Uh, pretty much all data, you can look at it in sort of a spreadsheet format, uh, and you should do that to make sure that you know what it looks like. Pretty much all of the tools that we're going to be using for data wrangling are going to depend on what the data looks like, right? You're going to take the data from where it is, and you're going to put it where you want it to be. Uh, so you have to know where it is to start. And if you don't look at your data directly, you're not going to know. You're probably going to write code that doesn't do what you think it's going to do. Uh, so you've looked at your data. You know where it is. Uh, you also want to think about what you want your data to look like when it's done. What do you want a row of data in your data set to be? What variables do you want to be in there? What order do you want them to be at? What format do you want them to be at? Uh, do you want to have multiple rows per particular category or something like that? Right? You want to think about these things so that you know what your target is. Once you know where you are, and once you know what your target is, you can get from one to the other. You, your next goal is to think, how do, can I take information from where it is and put it where I want it to be? Um, and so a lot of this is just thinking, okay, I can see what the data is. I, need, I know what shape I need it to take when I'm done. Uh, how can I tell the computer to recognize where, what it looks like now and so that it can reshape it how I want it? Let me give you a quick example that I was actually working on last night. So last night I was working on some proprietary data. I can't share it with you, but it was just a big old PDF, just a big old PDF with a bunch of unformatted text. Um, and uh, it looks something like this. So it had like info column and then it had payment. Right? It was like a register of payments and individuals. So it's like somebody's name, you know, Smith, John, and then this person got paid five bucks, $500. And then their address was one, two, three, four, South Lane, uh, in Seattle, Washington, uh, and their phone was uh, seven oh uh, blah, 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 right like that. Okay, so what do I want? This is what my data looks like, right? If I open up the data, it just looks like this. It's just a text file. It's not even a spreadsheet or anything like that. And I can think about what format do I want it to take when I'm done. Well, I wanted to have uh, data something that looks something like this. I wanted to have a name column. I want John and Smith, John to go in there. And I want to have an address column. And I want both lines of the address to go in there. So it should be 1234 South Lane, Seattle, Washington. Uh, I want to have a phone column. Right, and then you put the number in there, 723-2022. Uh, notice I don't want the word phone in there. I just want the number. I want payment. Okay, so uh, I, this is some actual data that I was presenting, or this is exactly what the data looked like, and I had a whole bunch of these names. It wasn't just the one, and so then the question was, well, I've got a bunch of this information. How can I tell uh, when a new row starts? How can I tell when it's a new person? Because if a data looks like this, I don't want to go through one by one and tell it, okay, John Smith starts on, on line two, and then the next John Smith is on line six, and then the next John Smith is on line 10. I need to figure out how I can take this information from where it is and put it where it needs to be. I needed to figure out a way to get the computer to recognize where the names are, because it doesn't know what a name is. So I had to think, how can I tell it what the names are? The way that I figured it out was, well, okay, uh, names always have commas in them in this particular data. So I'm going to tell it to look for com commas, but oh, wait, so do the addresses. So it's going to look for a comma and it's going to start reading down until it sees a colon. So the first comma, that's a name. Don't look for commas anymore until you see a colon, then look for commas again. Here's the next name. Okay, now there's a name, there's a colon, there's a comma, there's a colon, there's a comma, and I got the names out that way, right? And I was able to build this data set in that way because I looked at what the data looked like, 
This wouldn't have worked if I hadn't looked directly at the data. I thought about what I wanted it to be. I knew that I needed to get it to recognize where the names were so I could know where each chunk of information started. And I thought, how can I get it to recognize where it is and put it where I want it to be? All right, so then we, once we figure out where we want it to go from and where we want it to be, how we can take it from one to the other, after each step, you want to look directly at your data again to make sure that you, it's actually doing what you think that it's doing. It is very, very common in data wrangling to write a piece of code that does something that runs without error, but did not do what you thought it was going to do. Okay, So you all want to be sure to look at your code after every single thing that you do to make sure that it actually worked properly. In the context of this right here, I wrote my code that looked for a comma, that looked for a colon, and looked for a comma, that looked for a colon. Uh, and I didn't just say run it and be done with it. I looked at the names that it had extracted. Did you actually extract names? And it looked like this, you know, John Smith, John Smith, John Smith, John Smith. I was like, oh yeah, that looks like how I expected it to look. It pulled out all the names. That must have worked properly, right? Uh, but I've definitely, and it worked properly last night, but lots of times I've checked and it has not worked properly and you need to go back. So always check what you did uh, so that you make sure that it worked properly. I help a lot of people with data wrangling problems. The problems that they have are almost always do, not doing one of these four things, more so than getting the code wrong uh, or the, struggling with syntax. These are the real core issues. Any questions about any of this? All right. So. We want to look at our data. That's the thing that I'm really emphasizing here. How can we do that? How can we look at our data? Uh, one way is you can actually look at the data. If you're in R, you can just click on a data set and it will pop up uh, as sort of a spreadsheet here. That's going to take a minute because that's 18 million observations, uh, but you can do that. And you can also just use the view function with a capital V for some reason uh, to do the same. Uh, you can look at uh, descriptors of your data. Uh, so for example, uh, the V table package, which I uh, uh, like to shill because I wrote it, but uh, you can do V table of uh, your data and it will show you information about each of the variables. Uh, there we go. So it tells you what type each variable is, the values that it takes. You can also have it show you summary statistics or missing data and things like that. Uh, some table uh, gives you summary statistics. Uh, you can also check the actual value that things takes. Table and summary are both good functions for looking at the values of individual variables. And what you're looking for when you look at data is what values are in the data. Uh, what do the observations look like? Uh, any sort of missing or unusable data that you might need to fix? How the data is stru structured? All that sort of stuff, right? So if I look at, you know, head is another good one. It shows you the first, a couple of rows of your data. I can look at this and say, okay, uh, my variables were state FIPS, county FIPS, brands, uh, NAICS code, date, visits by day. What have I learned by just looking at the top six rows of this data? Well, for one thing, I know that date looks like it's properly formatted as a date. It's not like written out in as a string. Um, I know that uh, any ICS code appears to be dropping leading zeros because any ICS codes should be six digits long. Uh, I noticed that there are some observations that are missing the brands uh, uh, variable because there's nothing here, right? So there are variable observations in my data with missing brands. And so uh, I need to be able to handle that. I can't just assume that everything actually has a brand in this data. All right, so. We've got our, our basic ideas, our overarching things that we're gonna do for sure. We're gonna check our data a lot every step of the way. It'll save you time later when you realize that you've done something wrong and have to go back to fix it. The other thing about data wrangling is you tend to do it once and then never do it again for a particular data set. So you wanna make sure that you really get it right the first time. Okay, so how are we actually gonna do this? There are three stages of data wrangling. Uh, we're gonna start with going from records to data. Uh, we're going to go from data to tidy data, and then we're going to go from da tidy data to data that is ready for your analysis. We're going to go through each of those stages one at a time. First of all, from records to data, uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, so first of all, this is not something we're going to be focusing a whole lot on today, uh, but records, what I mean by records is the raw source that you have. Uh, often this is not in workable format. So uh, this could be something like, hey, I want to know about the uh, Google Trends for our brand keywords, right? Go, go to Google Trends and get data from Google Trends. Uh, or like I had with that John Smith data, here's a big old PDF of unformatted text. I want you to turn it into a database that I can use. Uh, I've handed you a scan, a, 50, a big old database of, of handwritten doctor's notes. I need you to turn them into something I can use. Or here's a website, scrape this website, uh, do a survey, right? There's data out there in the world and you need to turn it into usable data. This is the records to data stage. 
Uh, when you're doing this, do as little by hand as possible. You want to be sure to automate whatever you can. Do look at the data a lot to make sure that it's working as you expect. Uh, it's very common. For example, I do a lot of those PDF to text uh, uh, jobs. Uh, and it's very common for, for example, it to read a character incorrectly uh, so that you get a name that is like uh, uh, it has a colon where an I should be, right? Something like that. That's the kind of thing that you want to know is there. Uh, so you want to look at the data a lot. Uh, you do want to look for changes in formatting, right? Uh, so for example, maybe those doctor's notes, they use it, it for the first year of, of doctor's notes that you have. They got the doctor's name up here. They have the date over here. Then we have the description down here. And then maybe this year they swap. So now the description's up here and the name's over here and the, and the date's over here. Uh, that's going to change how you need to code up your things. So you want to make sure that you know how those changes are uh, there in the first place. Uh, as you're working with something that's really unstructured, like a PDF or text files or you know OCR data or something like that, uh, or a website where you're scraping, your real question you have to have in mind is, how can I tell a computer to spot where the actual data is? So that, that example that I gave of looking for the comma then the colon, that was how I told the computer to look for names. It doesn't know how to look for names. I need to figure out what pattern is there that I can tell it to follow. Uh, now, if your data set is very, very small, you can do things by hand. I don't recommend it. You're likely to make mistakes. Okay, so I'm not going to go super into detail on the technical aspects of reading in records because there's so many different kinds of records that it's sort of fruitless to try to go through all the things. Uh, but a, one thing that I will talk about is uh, compiling multiple kinds of files. It's very common uh, to come across data that is split into multiple files. Uh, so for example, maybe you have some sales records, one file for each month, and you need to combine them all into one data set. Uh, but they're already nicely formatted. You don't need to worry too much about it. How can we compile a bunch of data sets into one? Uh, so first thing we can do is we can use the list files function in R. Uh, this will give us a vector of file names. Uh, there are some nice options that you can use full names equals true. That will return to you the actual file path of the uh, thing. There's a pattern argument in there that you can use to say, look only for CSV files or only for Excel files or something. Once you have your list of files, you can use the map function from the per package. Uh, this is basically a replacement for for loops uh, that works a little bit better than for loops in R. Uh, and that will go through the list of files and it will apply some function to each of those files. And that function will probably incorporate things like reading in the file, maybe doing a little bit of processing. After the map, you will have a list of uh, data frames. Uh, then, uh, or data tables perhaps. Uh, then you will uh, want to have your own function that you can process each of those files that you put through map. Like I said, you can do some processing. Uh, you can turn them each into data tables and then combine them with rbind list. rbind list is a data table function that takes a list of data tables and just stacks them all on top of each other. Uh, and then you will have a combined data set. Let's see an example of this. Let's say we have 200 monthly sales reports. They're all in Excel. Uh, and you just want to pull two cells from each of those reports. Yeah, you got total sales, which is stored in cell C2. Uh, and employee of the month who's stored in uh, cell B43. And we know that those are the cells because we happen to look at the Excel sheets directly. We located where those cells were, and then we checked that the format didn't change. <gasps> oh, excuse me. Okay, how can we read in all these files and combine them together? Uh, so we need to read Excel files. Uh, the read Excel library will do that for us. And then as I mentioned, the per library will help us iterate. We're gonna start by getting the list of reports. So we're gonna use list files. Uh, I'm going to tell it where all those reports are stored. They're in the monthly reports folder. I'm going to tell it to look for a pattern. Maybe there's multiple files in there, but I only want these sales reports. So I'm going to look for file names that have the word sales in them. I'm going to ask for full names, which is going to give me the full file path of where those files are so that I can then read them in. So this is all going to be stored in file list. Once I have my file list, uh, I can uh, send it to map. So I have this file list. I'm going to send it to map read Excel, which is from the read Excel library. And that will just read in each of the Excel sheets. So now I have a list of read in Excel sheets in, in R. Then I'm going to take that list of Excel sheets. I'm going to pass them to this process file function. What's process file? Well, I made it myself. All right. So what this function does is it takes whatever data set I've passed to it. It pulls out uh, the uh, C2 uh, cell, which is sales, pulls out the B42 uh, or BB43 column, uh, which is employee. And then it returns a data table uh, which that, with that data. So then once I've done that, I have a list of data tables, each of them with one observation uh, for the month of data that I pulled from. And then I can pass all that with the pipe to our bind list, which will take all those individual data tables and smack them all together uh, into a single data table that now has the information that I need. 
All right, as I mentioned, we're not going super deep, deep into the details, technical details on uh, reading and records, uh, but that's sort of what we covered so far. Any, any questions on that before we move on to the next stage? Um, I do have a question about MAP. So you said that that's a, a better way to do for loops for R. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that only used for reading in the files? I, I guess it's because I've never really used mm -hmm. for loops when I've processed data, um, at least in R before. Um, mm -hmm. so, is, so in terms of using for loops, um, both for MAP and also in general, do you mostly use it when you're just trying to read in a lot of different files? Put them so I use map all the time. I use map okay. anytime I want to iterate over something. Okay. Uh, and so this can come in a lot of formats. So for example, let's say that I want to do a some sort of really complex operation to each row of a data set or each column of data set. I might use map because I'll iterate over the rows or I'll iterate over the columns. Or maybe I have a big old vector of uh, of strings uh, and I want to you know do each each thing. Or I, you know if, if you have a list of objects, anytime that you have that, you can you can iterate it over it, and it will pop up a lot. Um, uh, we'll, we'll use it actually again later in, in the talk here. Um, but yeah, anytime you want to iterate over something, it's a bit more convenient, uh, than using a for loop, uh, for loops also carry a, uh, performance penalty in R where they don't in most languages. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I look forward to the example later. Great. Any other questions? All right. Okay. So. We've gone from records to data very briefly. So hopefully we, we just get some nice data, uh, but now we need to tidy our data. So uh, data is anytime you have records stored in any sort of structured form, right? It doesn't matter what that format is. It doesn't matter if it's easy to use, uh, but there are, there are lots of different structures that data could come in. This is especially true if you're working in a business environment. Business environments and a lot of you know policy environments or whatever, um, they tend to store data in ways that make it easy to look up. That's usually what they are doing with their data. Uh, which is very different from the way that you would store data if you wanted to analyze it, right? So uh, they'll they'll create create a spreadsheet that has something like, okay, title of the very of the value, here's the value. Title of the value, here's the value. Title of the value, here's the value. But you want like a column of all the same values, not a bunch of different values. That's weird. Uh, what are you going to do about that? Or they'll they'll split their their data across a bunch of different tables, right? You might, for example, get an Excel sheet uh, or an Excel workbook that has a, a sheet for each different table in like a financial report or something like that, right? Great for looking it up, not so great for analyzing the data. Uh, so uh, what you're going to try to do in order to get something into an analytic form is to try to get it into a tidy data form. Uh, I've linked a, a walkthrough here for what for an, another walkthrough, but we're going to do uh, our own. So what is tidy data? In tidy data, each variable forms a column. So you've got all the, the a particular measure that you want to have that you've taken over and over again will be in a particular column. Right. So for example, uh, in that sales data, we have employee of the month. That is a column. And each row of that column will give us a different employee of the month for a different month, as opposed to having it a particular cell across a bunch of different Excel sheets. Okay. We want each, each variable to be a column. We also want each observation to form a row. Uh, when, you know, whatever measurement we have, we are going to have a row. So in that, in that uh, monthly sales data, you know, we had each uh, each month we had different values, so we would have one row for each month. Uh, and then number three, each type of observational unit forms a table. Uh, what I mean by that is, let's say we have, uh, well, uh, well, if our data is at the month level, if we have one one set of values per month, then we should have a table for month. Uh, in in that table, each row is a month, uh, and each column is employee of the month or sales. We might also have data at a different observational unit. So we might, for example, have a different data set, maybe not sales, maybe a stock price that is not at the month level, it's at the daily level. Now, days are inside of months, right? Uh, and so you might have a second table that has a month column telling you what month it is, a day column telling you what day it is, and then the stock price in its own column, right? So we have different tables for different observational units. The third one, I tend to fudge on a little bit, uh, but the first two are very good at the least. So the types of variables that we have in, in tidy data come in two main types. One is the identifying variables, also known as the keys. Uh, these are the columns that you would look at to locate a particular observation. So if we had a table of month and sales and employee of the month, I would want to think, OK, who was employee of the month in March of 2019? I would look at the identifying variables, which might be year and month. I would think, OK, 2019. Oh, there's 2019 in the year column. 
Uh, and there's March in the month column. So I'm, I can then look in that row to see who the employee of the month is in that month. Uh, and in that case, the year and month would be the identifying variables, they'd be the keys. Typically identifying variables and keys uh, will also uniquely identify a row. There should in general only be one row for each combination of month and year. So for example, I found that employee of the month in March of 2019, there should not be a different row in the data set that is also March 2019, right? Why would there be? There's only one sales value that month. There's only one employee of the month that month. Why would there be a second uh, row? That's not always true. Sometimes there are data sets in which you have multiple rows per set of identifying variables or keys, but uh, most of the time it, it would be unique. In addition to the identifying variables and keys, we also have the measures and values. Those are the actual uh, data. So here's some example data, and we can ask ourselves, what are the identifying variables or keys, and what are the measures or values in this data? Well, probably we would say that person and year are the identifying variables. They're the keys here. If I want to know how much shrimp uh, Chidi ate in 2018, I would look at the Chidi row, uh, or the Chidi, uh, uh, Chidi, I would look for Chidi in the person column, I would look for 2018 in the year column, and then I would follow it along to get shrimp consumption. Right, so uh, I've got uh, some measures and values here as well, points and shrimp consumption. Uh, and so those are the actual values that I would look up uh, in the rows that I have identified. So we have person and year as our identifying variables in this data. Uh, they uniquely identify a row in the data. Uh, and whatever combination of variables does uniquely identify, or sorry, whatever combination of identifying variables uniquely identifies a row is what we would call our observation level. So that data set, because we needed both person and year to uniquely identify a row, we would call that, that data would be at the person year level, right? Each row is a person year combination. There is not a second row with the same person year combination, making that our observation level. Uh, yeah. And so if we had variables that were a different level, maybe things that uh, were constant within person, but did not vary across years, uh, then that would maybe, maybe we'd want to go in a different table because uh, that, you know, uh, uh, then we'd have a separate table for our different observation levels. All right, so we have our idea of what tidy data is. We know what our goal is. We know what our, we want our data to look like. What are some examples of data that are not tidy besides the sales uh, example that I gave? So here's an example, a common one. Uh, this is a count table. Uh, what's going on in this table that's so big it doesn't even fit on the screen. Uh, so what this is, this is showing us for each religion, it is showing us a distribution of income. It's showing us the number of people who fit in each cell of this sort of cross tabulation, right? You might get something that looks like this if you were going to do like a pivot table in Excel or something like that. Or you might get it as like a response from a survey data. Uh, so what can we see from this? Okay, uh, there are in this survey data uh, 58 Buddhists who earn between 50 and $75,000. There are 732 Catholics who are in between 20 and $30,000, right? This is the number of people who fit in each cell, okay? So how do we know that this is not tidy? Well, uh, first of all, how would we look up a cell or how would we, what would we want to look at to look up a value in this table? We would want to say, okay, well, how many people uh, uh, are um, uh, uh, evangelicals who earn $100,000 to $150,000? Well, I would look up the religion and I would look up the income value. Those are my two keys. Those are my identifying variables. I have one key in a variable here, but the other one is, is across the top. It's not in its own column, right? So that's a problem right there. Uh, and then second, each observation is in its own row. No. Uh, so here we have all the agnostics together uh, in each thing right here. So it's, it, this is not an example of tidy data. We might want to uh, uh, tidy it. How can we do that? Uh, here's another uh, example of some non-tidy data. Uh, which has, this is what's called data in the wide format, uh, where we have some information on uh, billboard chart position for certain songs. We have the song, we have the artist, we have the track, we have the, the date that it entered the Hot 100, uh, and then we have its chart position in several different weeks, excuse me. Uh, and instead, uh, if I wanted to look up a value, I would say, okay, artist, track, date that it entered maybe, uh, and then what week is it? But that week is not in its own column, it's spread across a bunch of columns, uh, and so this variable here, right, the actual chart position is not in its own column. So this is not tidy data. Let's tidy this data. So there's a bunch of tools that we can use for tidying data. The first one that we're going to use uh, in our tidying toolbox is what's called the pivot. Uh, in this in data, data table, this is the pair of functions melt and decast. I think that those function names are a little bit confusing, but what are you going to do? Uh, 
Um, and what a pivot does is it, is it, it goes in two directions. Uh, so one of them takes a single row with a bunch of columns and turns it into one column with a bunch of rows. We can imagine how this might be handy. We have one row with a bunch of columns that we all want to be in their own in their own row, or sorry, in their own column right there, right? We want to have 87, 82, 72, 77. We want that to be all in its own columns. We want to flip them, okay? Uh, and it uses the identifying variables and keys to make sure that everything is lined up. We can also go in the other direction from, uh, and this right, this is known as going from wide data to long data. As I mentioned, this is wide data because the same uh, variable across different time periods is in e each time period is its own column. Uh, in long data, we have all the identifying variables in their own columns, and then we just have one observation per uh, song per time period. You can also go from long to wide. Uh, that's decast, uh, and that will come up a little bit later as well. Uh, I will point out pivot functions are notoriously difficult to use in pretty much every statistics package. Uh, one of the biggest gripes people have is about trying to do pivots properly. Uh, they're very hard. Um, and so this is a good one, easy one to mess up. Make sure to definitely, I mean, always do this, but definitely look at your, uh, your results after you do a pivot to make sure that it worked as you intended it to work. So let's do a pivot on that billboard data. So we want wide to long, right? We have one column per week and we want one row per week, uh, per song. So we're going to use melt. You can sort of imagine it as being like big old thing and then it sort of melts down to a narrow thing, but then why couldn't you just melt the other direction? I don't know. Anyway, um, so what do we need in our melt function? We need the data set that we are working with. Uh, we also need to tell it what the identifying variables are to just tell it the names of the variables that are our current identifying variables. Uh, we need the measure variables. Those are the variables that currently contain the values. By default, this is going to be everything that's not in the identifying variables. We need a variable name, which is going to be the name of the variable that we're going to tell it. Uh, what column we were just in is now going to be its own single column, uh, and then the value name right there. So how can we do this? What's happening? Why isn't... Oh, here it's frozen for a second. Why are you frozen? You're just a website. Oh my God. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's look at it on my computer directly as opposed to on the website. Maybe that is the issue. Why is it so slow? Sorry, it's just not responding to my arrow keys, which is very annoying. Okay, well, we're here. Okay, so I wanted to melt this data. So I'm gonna take my billboard data. I'm gonna pass it with the pipe to melt. And that will be our data. It will become the first argument there. Uh, what we can tell it. Well, so we, uh, we can tell it what our measure variables are. Um, I, can, I want it to be every variable that starts with the word with the letters WK. How can I tell it to identify these? Well, I can use the patterns function, uh, which is a handy way of uh, letting data table know uh, if I wanna look, look at a group of variables that have a similar, a certain naming structure. So they all started with the letters WK. So I can use the patterns function. Uh, this little caret here uh, tells us to look at the start of the variable name. Uh, and I'm looking for it to start with the letters WK. So it's gonna pick all of those. Uh, I can tell it uh, what I want the variable to be called to tell you what, uh, what uh, week we're looking at. Uh, and then the, uh, I wanna store the actual chart position itself in the chart position variable. And so I did that. It automatically picked the identifying variables. I didn't need to tell it because it was just everything that wasn't in measure variables. You can go either direction on that. You can specify just the ID, the ID variables. You can specify just the measuring variables. You can specify both. 
Uh, so what do we have here? So now it's got uh, Tupac, right, into the track, the date entered. Here's week one, the chart position of that in week one. Uh, let's go ahead and look at, there we go. So now we can see it has given each week of that song its own row. So now we have this, these as identifying variables, artist, track, date, under, and week. If I want to look at the chart position in a particular week, I can look at those columns to figure it out. Uh, and then uh, the chart position uh, will tell me where it is. So now I've, I've melted my data. It is now in long format, uh, in a tidy format, ready for me to use. There are other options that I could pick here as well. I could have, uh, there's an option that would let me strip out the WK here so that I would, it would just be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Might be handy. Uh, there are options for whether I want it to keep the, uh, the 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 columns that didn't have anything in them. There's a drop NA option. Uh, lots of options there. Any questions about melts? All right. Can anybody confirm for me that you can still hear me? Just the that the weird slide thing. I can hear you. Okay, good, good, good. Yep. I was just worried because the slides weren't working. Maybe it was my internet or something. Okay. So what would the um, what would the equivalent in tidyverse be to melt? Uh, it would be uh, oh uh, pivot longer. Oh, there, there it goes. Yeah. Okay. Which I guess I left some of the tidyverse code in here, right where, right there, because these are uh, tidyverse commands right there. Um, okay, so now let's talk about going wide from long to wide. Why might we need to do this? Well, in a lot of business data. Uh, you have, as I mentioned, like something like a, it looks like a tax form, right? Here's the name of the value. Here's the value. Here's the name of the next value. Here's the next value. Bah, 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 bah. These are values stored in rows. We want them to be stored in columns, right? So uh, we can do that with uh, going in the other direction. So here's some data. It uh, looks like a tax form. Here's the person's name, their income, their deductible, their, their adjusted gross income, and all that. So we're going to cast in the other, we're going to, instead of melting down the data to a long format, we're going to cast it into a wide format. Uh, we're going to use decast. What we need for decast, we need the data, of course, that we're working with. Uh, we need a formula that's going to tell it how to structure the data. And this is the hardest part of using decast. I don't know why decast uses a formula and melt doesn't. Like I said, these functions are fiddly, fiddly in every language. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so often we will need a, a key that tells it how to arrange things. So if we have multiple uh, rows with the same, uh, that should be on the same uh, uh, column or something like that, we might tell it, but here there's nothing because there's only one observation really. Um, okay, so here's how we can do it. So here's the formula that uh, I'm going to give it. So why did I come up with this formula? Where did that come from? So um, what the formula is, what did I say on the next slide here? I don't. Why don't I say it? Anyway. Okay, so um, the uh, what the formula does is you want to tell it first what you want the new observation level to be after you've cast it wide. Okay, so here I only had one row of data, right? There's no identifying variables at all, so I don't. I'm not going to need any identifying variables after I'm done. So I'm just going to put a little period there for don't give me anything. I don't need it. Okay, then the tilde, which tells us that we're working with a formula here, on the right. I'm going to put every additional variable that is currently an identifying variable in the long data that I no longer want to be an identifying variable in the wide data. Okay. So if I look back at this data here, tax form row is an identifying variable, right? Because if I want to look up a value, I would say, okay, what, what row am I looking at? Let's say income. Okay, here's the income uh, uh, right there, right? That is an identifying variable. But I no longer want it to be an identi identifying variable because I want each of these to be its own column. So because it is an additional identifying variable in the long version, but I don't want it in the wide, it's going to go on the right. And it's going to get rid of these identifying variables. So you can see that it, it, it uh, sort of brings it up here. Here's the new identifying variable, just a period. Uh, and then here is uh, uh, all of the data that we had sort of rotated up, brought, brought to be wide. Um, Something to note, by the way, these are all currently character variables as opposed to numbers. They look like numbers, but they're actually strings. Uh, that is because here, all of this is in the same column. So it all has to be the same variable type. So they're all strings because James A. Caster is a string. So these all have to be strings too. So after we melt it or after we cast it, everything's going to be a string still until we reassign its types, which we'll talk about how to do in a bit. 
Um, I have a question about this mm -hmm. yeah. real quick. So um, for this one, you just put the period there because you didn't have um, mm -hmm. any of the variable. Um, if you had, so in this, in the original data, it, it looks like it's just that tax form row, which is what you um, made long, and then those associated values that would then go in that row. If you had other columns that you didn't want to cast out, mm -hmm. um, would you have to put all of those columns there in place of that period? So if you wanted them to stay the same? Yeah. Um, I believe you would not have to. I think what it does is it looks, it, it, I, I'm pretty sure DCAST preserves any variable that it doesn't have a problem with. Um, and so if you have data that should that should just work fine, then you can leave it out. It should work okay. Um, but as, as always, check after you do it just to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So commonly when you have something like this, you probably got a lot of them. Uh, so we can just row by it. So maybe we have you know eight eight thousand different tax forms, each of them looking like this. We can decast each each of them, and then we can row bind or r bind list them together, or r bind, which is what you do if they're not currently in a list. So we got two of those. I uh, cast both of them, and I stacked them on top of each other with r bind list. All right. The next thing that we're going to do for tidying data is merging data. It's very common that you will need to link two data sets together based on some shared keys. So as I mentioned before, maybe we have a data set that is person and year. Then we have a data set over here that's just person, but maybe I want to analyze all those things together. I need to bring those things together into the same table. Uh, so here's an example of some data. This is some person year data. So we have a bunch of people here and year, and then their income in that year. Okay. And then here's a second data set with uh, some people. Now, this is a person level data set. It's got one row per person, whereas this one had one row per person per year. Uh, this one's just per person and it's got their birthplace, right? Which makes sense, right? That birthplace is not going to change over the course of your lifetime. So we only need person level data to explain birthplace. So how can I bring these two things together? Well, I can use merges, uh, which you might know as joins uh, if you're working in Python. Uh, similar idea, there are some slight differences. Uh, so the merge function in data table will do this. It will do it very quickly as well. Uh, so um, uh, there, there is also an, a merge in base R, but the one in data table works much faster. If you've loaded data table and you're working with data tables, it should use the fast one. If it's very slow, just make sure that both of the things you're merging are data tables first. Okay. So we'll know what to do. Uh, so in the data table, in the merge function, you're going to tell it the two data sets that you want to merge together. You're going to use a by option to tell it what are the shared keys to merge on. Uh, and then there are some options, uh, the all options all by itself, all X and all Y. And those tell you what to do if not every observation finds a match. And I'll talk about those in a second as well. So here is an example. Let's take person year data uh, and let's merge it with person data. So the first ops argument was person year data. The second argument is person data. Those are the two, very, two uh, data sets that I'm merging together. I am merging them by person because they share the key variable of person, right? Uh, and I'm going to set all dot X equal to true. So what's that going to do? So you'll notice, by the way, you'll notice that in these data sets that I had, David is in the person year data, but he's not in the person data, right? So when I merge these data sets together, David is not going to find a match. So what should we do with David? Do we want to keep him in there just without a birthplace? Do we want to drop him, right? We need to, you know, figure this out. So uh, what all dot X will do is it will keep all of the, the rows in the first data set, the X data set, as opposed to the Y data set. It will keep all the rows in the X data set, even if they don't find a match. Okay. So David was in the first data set. He was in person year data, but not person data. He didn't find a match. But because all X is true, it will keep David anyway, just without a birthplace. Okay. As opposed to uh, all Y is true, right? So this will say, okay, David didn't find a match, uh, but he's in the X data set, not the Y data set. I'm keeping all of the Ys. But you know he's not there, so he's going to get dropped, right? He's so David's not in here. Uh, if I just set all equal to true by itself, it would keep them whether they were uh, didn't find a match from either data set. And if you leave it blank, it will drop everything that doesn't find a match. Okay. So thinking about all these different aspects, it's important, right? What are the two data sets you're working together with? What are their shared keys? Right? You need to have shared keys to merge on for this all to work. And what do you want to do with the observations that don't find a match? 
Another important thing to keep on in mind is that when you're doing this, you really want it to be sure that the shared set of keys is the observation level in at least one of the data sets. So the keys that you have that are shared uh, should uniquely identify or the rows of the data in at least one of the data sets. And if it doesn't, you're going to run into some problems. So what's it going to do if you have multiple observations for each combination of variables in both? That's going to be a problem. So let's give some example data here. So here's one data set, the A data set. Uh, it's got a variable name, which has A, A, B, C, and then years, 2014, 2015, 2014, 2014. So this data set is on the name year level, right? The combination of name and year gives a unique row. There's no, there's no two rows that have the same combination of name and year, okay? Now let's look at, uh, at B. It's got name A, A, B, C, C, uh, and it is just at the name, uh, it, it is at, it's at neither level, right? So it is, it, you, there's, uh, um, the name but does not uniquely identify the rows here, but they have the shared name variable. So what happens if I merge A with B by name, right? So it is not the uh, uh, observation level in either data set. A has an observation level. It's at the person, it's at the name year uh, level, but those, uh, but just name by itself does not uniquely, uniquely identify the rows. B doesn't really have an observation level uh, because there's, there's multiple observations per name. So when I do this, I'm going to get A not two times, right? It's two times over here, two times over here. I'm going to get it four times because it's going to give me each combination of those multiple rows, right? Because it doesn't know what to do, right? It says, hey, how do you want these combined? I guess I'll just give it all to you. Uh, so you want to make sure before you merge that you have that, that you have you, that um, the set of variables that you are merging on is the, the unique observation level in at least one of the data sets. If it's in, all, in one but not the other, it can handle that. We already did that, right? Uh, it just it just duplicates the one that is is unique into the one that's not. Uh, but if they're both not, then it's going to do this sort of cross combination thing, which sometimes is what you want, but very rarely is it what you want. Uh, so you want to be aware of that. How can you check uh, whether or not it is the unique observation level? You can use the duplicated uh, function. Uh, so uh, we're going to use uh, a. We're going to pick the person variable here, and what I'm doing is I'm checking if person is the is the uh, observation level of the A data set. I'm picking the person variable. I'm passing that to the duplicated function. Uh, this will check whether each of the observations is duplicated anywhere else. And I'm gonna check whether any of them are duplicated. I'm looking for the maximum duplicated value. If this is true, uh, then at least one row is duplicated, showing us that we were wrong about the observation level and that indeed there are multiple observations per person. Uh, once you, if you find that there, that it doesn't work, then you can figure out what to do at that point. Maybe you want to drop some observations. Maybe you want to pick one of the observations. Uh, you can accept the multiple matching, whatever you want to do. But you want to be aware that that's what you're doing at least. Good. Um, I have a question. Uh, so again, I just want to double check. Um, so when we're merging data in this example, you merged it on one variable. Um, can you merge it on multiple or do you have to create a separate column that's like a concatenation of no, you can, you can do it on multiple. So just instead of, uh, let's say I could do on person and year, mm -hmm. I would do, you know, uh, merge A, B, by person. Okay. Okay. And then same with checking, checking um, duplicate values. Can you check duplicate values on multiple as well? Yes. So here... I would just do person. And if this approach to selecting variables doesn't look familiar to you, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. And then also, sorry, another question. There was um, when it was talking about how you want to handle the values that might not appear mm -hmm. in one or the other tables. Um, I saw you had all X, all Y. Um, the What about for if you want to keep the ones that um, you know, like aren't in one table, you, you know, like some mm, like an a anti join. Yeah, an anti join. Yeah. I forget how you do an anti join in merge. I'm not sure that you can, that it does it by itself. Um, oh, okay. There is in the tidyverse the anti-join function, which does that. Mm -hmm. um, but what you, what I would probably recommend you do at that point is do the merge um, with with all equals false, so you only keep the matches, 
And then uh, uh, you'd basically want to um, do some sort of filtering for rows that are not in that data set. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And on the topic of uh, merging data, so this one, it took the argument of data X and data Y. Is that the same thing as a left and right table? Yes. Talking about joins? Yeah. So tidyverse uses left and right, merge uses X and Y. Okay. Uh, in the data table in particular, there is another way to merge, uh, which is actually faster. Uh, I find it a little bit more confusing, but so I don't use it that often, but it is faster and it lets you do some cool things, which is you can just put one data set inside the other. So here we have two data tables and data table one, I'm going to merge it with data table two on instead of by and the set of keys that I want, right? Uh, this totally works. If you just do it like this, it will do exactly what we just did. Um, there are some extra tricks that you can do with this particular version. You can do what are called rolling joins. Uh, so let's say that you want to merge two data sets, but you don't want to do it exactly. Right. So let's say, let's go back to our person year data. Uh, let's say that I have um, a second person year data set or a, a very a second data set that is maybe, let's say, uh, uh, your most re the the year that you got your degree, another data set, right? Uh, and all the different degrees that you got. So we have David uh, got a, a high school degree in 1997, and he got a college degree in 2001. Okay, and I want to know for each year of income what is the most recent degree that they earned. Well, I can't just do that merge, right? Because it's going to try to like merge 2014 with 2001, and those aren't the same number. So how do I do that? So I would use a rolling merge, uh, which basically looks, it's, I'm going to try to line, line this very, this, these variables up with these variables, but I'm not going to uh, require that they're the same. I'm just going to look for the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the biggest value, the closest value, or perhaps the closest value that's smaller. So I'm going to look at 1997 and 2004 and say, oh, 2004 is closer to 2014 than 1997, so I'm going to use that one. So uh, I'm not going to go super deep into the, the syntax on this one, but there's some cool stuff that you can do with this alternate uh, merging process um, that you can look into if you want to look at the help files there. All right. Any questions? So this is, that's all we have on tidying data, going from data to tidy data. Any questions on, on this whole process here before we go further? If you have a really big merge, by the way, this is definitely what you want to do. It is much faster. Um, would you recommend that if you need to do like uh, multiple merges? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's more about the size of the merge than how many you're doing. Oh, okay. uh, you know, a hundred merges for a hundred observations each is a lot faster than one merge of a million observations, right? Yeah. Um, Thank you. That said, merge is already pretty fast, right? We did this one here, right? And that was 18 million observations and it happened in less than a second. So you're really only gonna have to worry about that sort of speed when you're working on really big data sets. All right, so we have tidy data. Now we wanna get it ready for our analysis. And here's where a lot of the data table specific stuff is gonna come in. Uh, we haven't doing, been doing a whole lot of that so far. Right? We did melt and decast, uh, but those are honestly from base hard, but only some slight adjustments. Um, and we did that merging thing, but anyway. So here's what we're actually going to use to learn data table uh, really well. So we have our nice tidy data set, but it's not ready for our analysis just yet. Uh, we need to do an, a fair amount of cleaning and manipulation to get it ready for our data. So now we need to learn how to work with the data table syntax. So data table uh, is fairly simple, actually, in terms of how its syntax works. And there's, a, there's only three things that you can do, but it is fantastically flexible with what you can do with those three things. So data table uh, is a data table. And if you're familiar with data frames, right, you, you sort of know how they work, right? So if you have a data frame, oops. So, you know, data frame, let's say empty cars. This is a data frame, right? Data frame. Uh, and I can do something like this. I can say empty cars, you know, uh, give me the, the fourth row of the third column and it will tell me what that is, right? I can look at it. So this sort of thing right here, the indexing, we're going to sort of mimic 
that syntax a little bit, but we're going to expand upon it quite a bit and in ways that are a lot that are going to be a lot more powerful. So the three things that we can do. So instead of just those two observed things where we can pick rows and then columns, we have not just rows and columns, but we have we can filter. Okay, and that's going to that is going to be rows. So the first argument is going to be things that we do with rows, picking rows. Then we have our variable operations, and this is not just picking columns, but also manipulating columns. Okay, so all of our column operations are going to go here. And then we have our groupings. We can do things by group very easily. Uh, and there are more arguments in data table than just these three, but these are the three main ones that we use pretty much all the time. Uh, so we can use these three operations to do pretty much anything that we like. Uh, and there are also some wrapper operations around this that uh, uh, sort of make some of these operations a little bit easier to do, um, but, and, and we'll go into some of those as well. There's also a data table cheat sheet that's linked here if you want to check it out. Okay, so uh, that's the basic syntax that we're going to be going for, right? Rows, then columns, and then grouping. Um, and I want to talk about something that we can do with these in data table that we can't do in any other part of R as far as I know which is something called in-place manipulation. And this is one of the things that makes data tables so fast. So typically in R, if you want to change something, you have to reassign it. So let's talk about computer memory, how computer memory works. So how does a computer remember that you have data? Well, it's got a memory chip in there. Uh, and in that, inside that memory chip are lots of little electrical signals basically running around. They're either high or low, one or zero, okay? And there's a, some, some power continuously running through it. All right. Now, if you want to change something, you want to change what it remembers, what the computer remembers, you have to go through and change whatever signals are in there. Okay. And if you say, okay, I want to, you know, I want to rewrite this data set, it's going to have to go through the entirety of that data set and rewrite everything about it. Okay. And that's very slow. So let's say we have a number here, we have A, and A is, uh, let's say, five. Now in my computer somewhere, there's some, some signals going on, some electricity in there that is uh, storing the number five. It's representing it in some way in electrical signals. And it is knowing that I have the label A on it there. Okay. So what's going to happen if I want to increase A by one? If I do this, A is A plus one. What does it have to do to do this operation? So first thing it has to do, it has to look for A. It's going to look up the place in memory where A is being stored. It's going to go there. Okay. It's going to pick out that, that, that value, which currently is five. Now it's got five. Then it's going to run the operation of adding one to that. Now it's got six. Then it's going to go back into the memory. It's going to find some other place to store the new A, and it's going to label it A. It has to do all of those things. What if we could just say, hey, I know where A is. I'm just going to pop in there real quick and change that to a six. Right? I can skip the extraction. I can skip the finding a new place in memory. I can skip rewriting all of it down. And that's what in-place manipulation is, OK? So uh, for variable manipulation, there's a couple of different ways we can do in-place manipulation in data table. Uh, the main place that you're going to be doing them is probably in the variable manipulation, in that second part of data table, where we're changing what columns are. We can do in-place manipulation uh, in data table with what's called the walrus operator. It's kind of like a little walrus if you turn it on its side. Uh, and uh, this is our way of assigning variables in place, where instead of having to rewrite the whole thing, we just go in and say, hey, you got a new variable here, data table, check it out. Uh, there are also a number of other functions that do in-place manipulation. They all begin with the word set. So if you look in the help uh, file for the data table package, right, help package equals data table, it'll pop up all the functions that are here. We can scroll down to the S's and see all the different set functions that are here. And these are all functions that do in-place manipulation. Um, a lot of these also have uh, uh, names like the end in V. Uh, so these uh, you might need to put in uh, the variable names. Uh, not important. Anyway, if you want to put in a pass a variable name as a string, you use the version that ends in a V. Um, just slightly faster, very slightly, but also works better with programming. So. Um, we're going to be using in-place manipulation. I'm going to talk about how to do it, uh, but this is something we have a goal in mind. Some of the things about data table, including in-place manipulation, break with typical R practice, and so you might not see them in other parts of R or even some other languages. A lot of these things you can't do in pandas, for example. Um, first of all, uh, so if, you if you pass a data table to a function and then you change the data table inside that function using in-place manipulation, it will retain when you come back out. 
This is not standard. Let me give you an example. So I'm going to do a function. Uh, let's just say our function is an adder function. And it's going to take our data table x. And I'm going to say uh, x is, uh, let's see here. I'm going to add one to the am variable. OK, so if I look at uh, the mean of MT cars AM, oh, I'm return nothing, by the way. Return false. Great, so it's 4 .0, uh, 0.0062. Okay. If I do uh, adder of MT cars, right, it's going to send MT cars in here. It's going to add one to the AM variable. Great, I've run it. And what if I do the mean now? Still 4.062. 4 I right, didn't change anything, right? Because I changed it inside the function, right? And I didn't return it back out. I just kept it inside the function. Once the function was over, forgot it entirely, okay? What if I do the same thing with data table? So I'm gonna do my DT empty cars. It's gonna be an as data table empty cars, great. I'm gonna do a new function, also called adder. Um, and then that's gonna take in the empty cars and I'm gonna do DT empty cars. I'm going to do my in place manipulation, am, am plus one. Still going to return nothing. It's not going to bring anything back out. But if I do adder, oh, so let's do mean dt mt cars am, 4.062, adder dt mt cars, right? Still just didn't return anything. But now if I do this, it should be increased by one, right? It changed it inside of the function, even though I didn't pass the object back out because it is manipulating it directly in memory. That's a cool little trick, which sometimes means that you do things that you didn't intend to do. So keep that in mind. Uh, but that is a cool little trick that breaks with traditional R practice. Typically in R, inside of a function, we forget everything that happened unless you pass it back out. Not necessarily the case with data table. Uh, next thing that breaks with R practice is that uh, if you copy a data table, if you make a copy of it and you make changes to the copy, those changes will also be in the original. Uh, so let me show you that. So uh, I had DT empty cars. Uh, the mean of AM is currently 1.4. I'm going to do uh, uh, DT2. And it's just going to be DT empty cars. All right. So now I have a second one. It's the exact same as the original. DT2, AM, AM plus one. And then uh, DT empty cars, AM 2.4. Right. I changed the DT2 and it changed the original version. Okay. This is actually fairly common in other languages uh, where you, because we're just making a new reference to the original object that's in memory, we're just placing a new name that points at it. So if we change the thing, of course, it's going to change this version too, right? So if you want to make a copy of a data table and not have it affect the original, you got to use copy to make a new copy that is distinct from the original. Now, this is also known as a deep copy in Python. Um, Another thing that breaks with our practice, if you put the, na the name of the object by itself, uh, sometimes it won't print. So sometimes it does. Uh, let's see if it will for MT or DT empty cars. It did. OK. Uh, but sometimes it won't. <laughs> uh, if it's very big, sometimes, for example, um, you need to put the, the, the brackets there so it'll actually print it. All right. Um, yeah, so those are some. Those, those are, so we've gone over data table what it is. We've gone over the three different aspects of its syntax. Uh, we've talked about the idea of in-place manipulation. We haven't really done a whole lot of it yet. And some of the odd results that you can get uh, that are uh, non-typical for R. Uh, but now let's actually you know, do some data table stuff. So first, let's focus on that first argument, the row selection, that first part of data table. So we can pass a logical condition uh, to data table, and it will pick rows for us. Uh, so for example, Income is above 100,000 It is a logical condition. It will check whether each value of income is above 100,000. If it's true, it will keep that row. If it's not true, it will drop that row. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a logical condition I can put in. So I've, I've merged those two data sets together. Uh, then I'm going to use my brackets. I only need, if I'm only using the first argument, I don't need this, the comma or anything like that. I can just give it to this right here. I can say, give me back just the rows of this merged data for which income is above 100,000, or uh, I guess I said 10,000 here. Excuse me. Um, two things to notice. One, uh, as I mentioned, I didn't. I don't need to put the column. If I'm only using the first argument, I don't need to specify the second one at all. 
Second, I did not have to say, you know, uh, person year data dollar sign income. Right? Inside a data table, much like in the tidyverse, uh, if you're working with a data table and you say the name of a variable, it will know that you're talking about the name of that variable inside this data. Right? So you don't need to, you know, re-specify the data set name, which is one of the most annoying things about working with base R. Uh, so here we have just the rows that have uh, income above 100,000, which, or I guess 10,000, which happens to be all of them. Uh, so we've selected rows in that way. This just requires, requires us to create a logical condition for what rows we want. Setting up logical conditions is a very important part of programming in general, not just in data table uh, or not just in data analysis even. Um, but uh, we need to be able to figure out how to write something that checks values. Okay. Uh, so in R, true is all capitals true, which turns into a one, uh, or false in all capitals, uh, false, which turns into a zero. You can also use just T and F. Um, but I would not recommend this uh, because you can overwrite these. So for example, uh, if I want to do, hey, true and false, that should be false, right? But I can reassign F to be one. And now it's just a value, it's just a variable F, it's one. Now if I do T and F, I get true, which shouldn't be the case, right? True and false should be false, but because I reassigned F, now it's true. That's why I don't recommend using T and F. If I try to do this with false, it shouldn't work. Right, it doesn't let me do that. Okay, so TNF is possible. Don't recommend it. Um, anyway, so uh, we do a calculation. Uh, uh, or sorry, uh, we want to uh, check whether things are true. Um, one thing that I common, commonly see when people are starting out is they'll I'll use if else all the time. Often you don't need it, especially if you, this is what you're writing right here. If you're doing if else, check a condition, true, false. This is completely redundant. This gives you the exact same result as if you just wrote the condition itself. Uh, checking the condition will just give you true if it's true and false if it's false. You don't need the if else. Uh, even if you did want if else, uh, if else is slow. F if else is faster. Uh, the F stands for fast, fast if else. Uh, this is in data table. And if you are going to use if else, you might as well use fifth else, uh, which is a faster version of if else. Some tips for constructing logical conditions, especially when you're selecting rows. Uh, so, you know, if you're checking the values of two variables, right? you can check if one's greater than the other, less than the other. If you want to check if they're equal, you want to use the double equal sign. A double equal sign will check if something is true. A single equal sign will try to assign something to be true. Uh, if you want to check if two things are not equal, you can use the, the exclamation mark uh, for not equal. Um, checking if something is in a list, you can usually do using the, uh, the, the in uh, operator here. Uh, so A in uh, C, B, or B, C, D, E, F. Uh, this will check if the value A is, in, is either uh, the B value, the C value, the D value, the E value, or the F value, it will return to true if it is in that list and false if it's not. Uh, this one also works for text. Um, some tips for logical conditions. Uh, if you want to check the opposite of it, you just put an exclamation mark in front of it. Uh, so for example, two plus two double equal sign four is true because two plus two evaluates to four, four evaluates to four, double equal sign checks that those two things are equal. They are, gives you true. Put that all in parentheses. Uh, that will all still give you true and false. Put an exclamation mark in front of it, and that swaps to false and then true. Uh, so two plus two equals four. That evaluates to true. The exclamation mark flips that from true to false. You can chain multiple conditions together. Uh, you can use an ampersand for and. Uh, you can use this little bar, uh, which is also known as a pipe. Confusingly, it's not the same as the other kind of pipe that we use uh, called or. That's for or. Uh, if you want to combine multiple logical conditions, you want to be careful about using parentheses to combine them so you don't get something that you don't expect. Uh, so each individual statement should be in its own set of parentheses. Uh, oh, another note for uh, data table and logical conditions. Um, so notice here uh, our VS variable is zero and one. So that is a zero and one. We could use that to select, let's say, just the rows that are VS, right? So I might want to do MT, uh, DT, MT cars. Vs, right? Now this is a condition, either true or false, either one or zero. However, uh, data table does not quite like this. If you just have a variable that has true and false in it, you'll want to put parentheses around it just so that it recognizes that that's what you're doing. Uh, oops, there we go. There we go. Yeah, so um, uh, give me the zeros. Why do you give me the zeros?
there we go. Now it just gave me those groups. <laughs> there we go. So if you want to just, if you have a variable that you are, that's just true or false and you just want to pick the trues, uh, you want to make sure to put parentheses around that variable name. Otherwise it won't work. All right. Okay. So that's the basics of row operations. Any questions about that? We're really just picking rows at this point with logical conditions. And there's lots of functions that can give you a logical true or false. All right. Okay, now let's get on to the fun part, column operations. So column operations are the second argument here, the J. Uh, and so there's two main ways to do them. We can either do them in place or not in place, and they both have their own um, times when you want to do them. So uh, for not in place operations, you provide a list of variables, and you can optionally reassign those variables or assign new ones to be what you want them to be. Uh, every variable that you don't include in that list is going to be dropped. So you need that is one of the annoying things about the uh, non in place operations. You have to specify all the variables that you want to keep. So here's some examples. Uh, so first of all, something to note this little dot that I've been putting the dot and then parentheses that is in data table a shorthand for list. So what we're doing here is we're specifying a list of variables. Right? List is a very general uh, object type in R that can basically it's just a bunch of stuff all in a list. It can be any sort of stuff. Doesn't need to be the same thing. It can be a character and then a string, or a character and then a, a number, and then a data table, and then a data frame, and then a function, and they're all in the same list. You can basically put whatever you want in there. Uh, data tables and data frames are technically lists. Uh, and so uh, they're just lists of columns. You know, each entry in a data frame is a column in a list. So um, uh, in these, because these are not in place, we need to reassign as we normally would if we want to keep our, our changes. Uh, so let's do a quick example here in, let's run it in R here. So we're going to use a data table version of MT cars as we were already doing. First of all, I want to just select some columns. I can say, okay, I don't need anything in my first argument. I'm not picking particular rows. I want all the rows. And then give me the variables, MPG and HP. You can see there's a lot more variables than that. But here, it will just give me the variables that I have specified. Okay. Notice, by the way, I did not do this in place. So the original data set is still there. right? If I want to keep it just that way, I would need to overwrite the MT cars data set like I did here. Uh, I can also uh, give it a vector of uh, strings, or I can give it a vector of indexes. So I can see that uh, MPG and HP are the first and fourth variables, so I can do that as well, gives me the exact same result. I can also pass it uh, some strings if I want to do that. I can do C, MPG, HP, okay, same deal. Um, you want to use lists if you're using a non-quoted, you're just putting the name of the variables in there. Okay, so MPG, HP, that goes in a list. If I want to give it strings, uh, then I want to use C, like it's a vector of character names. Uh, what if I want to uh, also create a new variable? I can also do that not in place as well. So here I've got uh, MPG, HP, I'm keeping those in the data set. And I want to create a new variable called ratio. And I want that to be the ratio of miles per gallon to horsepower, if I want that for some reason. I do that. And of course, I get that variable as I specified in there. Right? Everything that I want to be in the new data table, I just want to put in that list. I can keep it as is by just giving it the name of the variable, or I can create a new variable or overwrite an old one by uh, using the equal sign here, which will tell me to reassign a variable uh, as some new value. Uh, oh, as I mentioned, you want to use a list uh, when you just have an unquoted variable name, but use C uh, when you are wanting to put in strings uh, for some reason. Uh, if you have a variable that contains strings in it, uh, then you want to include the option with equals false so that it knows you're not looking for a variable called var names. You're looking for this object here, which is storing our var names in it. So here I've stored some variable names. Uh, I've stored the vector MPG and HP. I want to get just those columns out. So I'm passing it that list, that, that, that vector of variable names, but I need to know that I'm not looking for the var names variable. I'm looking for the var names object, which has my variable names in it. And so I say with equals false. And these give me the same result here. All right, so those that's that's our basics of uh, oh uh, yeah any any questions about that at this point? All right. So uh, a lot of these column operations are about what to calculate. 
so, uh, uh, oh yeah. So one of the nice things about data tables, it's very easy to just pull calculations out of there. So for example, uh, one thing we could do with normal R would be to take empty cars, pull out the HP variable and then take the mean of it, right? So what if I just want to do that with data table? Might even be faster. Uh, I can say, hey, I want the mean of the HP column uh, right there. And notice here, I'm not assigning this to anything. I didn't put a list in. I'm not saying, you know, mean HP equals mean of HP. I can just get the mean of HP. It will just give me the number right there, right? Uh, so I can do the operation inside the data table. And if I don't give it a list, it will just give me back out the result, right? As opposed to storing it in the data table. If I wanted to just store this result, I would say something like, uh, hey, I want a list of variables to keep. I want mean HP is mean of HP, and then it will give me a data table back, which includes this stuff. If I wanted it to be the original as well, right, I might do something like this, uh, HP, I want to keep HP, and then also have the mean of HP in its own column, okay? So depending on whether I give it a list or just a calculation, uh, and uh, that's going to tell me whether I'm going to get back just a value or a data table, and uh, whether I give it back uh, uh, a variable as well, or just the uh, sorry, to here, I just gave it um, a calculation that's going to have one number output, right? The mean of HP only has one value. So I'm going to get back a data table that has one value. In this one, I've given it two things. I've given it this variable here, which has, what is it, 32 values, and then mean HP, which only has one. So it's going to give me back all 32 of those values as I wanted, and then it's going to just recycle the one value that I had to fill up the space. Um, we can also use this approach uh, without the list to pull a variable out entirely. Uh, so I can do, you know, empty cars HP. That will give me back not a data table. It will give me back the vector of values. I can do that here as well. If I don't give it a list, it will also give me back the vector of values. Basically, don't give it a list, uh, and it will just give you back the values, whether that is the value of the variable you've asked for or the calculation you've asked for. Uh, if you do give it a list, it will give you back a data table in some way. You can also mix the row operations with the column operations. So you can imagine what this does right here. That is going to give you the mean of HP just over the observations that have an AM value of one. This is a much easier way of combining row and column operations than is available in either base R or in the tidyverse. So I just want the mean over the AM one values. There we have it. Okay, so that's the basics of not in place variable operations. We can also do in place column operations. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, we're going to use the, the walrus operator here. Now, the nice, a couple of nice things about this one, it's much faster than the non in place ones. Two, it, does, it doesn't try to get rid of all the other variables, right? So, in the, in the non in place ones, I had to list each variable in the list that I wanted to keep. Everything else got dropped. Here, it just affects the variable that I'm talking about. So, when I do this one, it is going to create the new uh, ratio variable in empty cars. I don't need to reassign anything. So this will actually make the change in empty cars here. And uh, it will keep all the old variables. It will not get rid of everything else. All right. So now I have that new variable. I have kept all the old variables. Uh, and I didn't need to reassign empty cars. I just did this in place operation and empty cars just has it. Uh, you can do two, two operations at once or multiple operations at once. Uh, Remember before I used the back ticks with the double brackets to use the, 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 the selection operator. Here I can use the back ticks with the walrus operator to do multiple walrus things. So I've got a back tick, walrus operator, back tick, and then I've got a, a just a, I'm passing it to the walrus operator function. Okay. I've got ratios MPG equals HP. I've got HP square is the square of HP. Here I can do two operations at once, and now I've got both of those variables in there. You can also use in-place operations to drop variables. Uh, this is typically how I will drop variables unless I'm dropping a whole bunch at once. You just set that, that variable equal to null, and it will go away. And that's really the basics of in-place column operations. That's really all that there is to it. There's not a whole lot more to it. Uh, uh, but any questions about it? What does the walrus do again? So the walrus makes it an in-place operation. So as opposed to uh, reassigning the data table object, it just goes into the variable, makes the changes right there. Got it. Uh, 
Um, some, some handy functions that will come in handy when you are creating variables. Uh, one of them is F case. This comes in, into play a lot with data wrangling. So we, I mentioned if else or fifth else, uh, which is you have a condition and what do you do if it's true? What do you do if it's false? F case is like that, but a lot broader. So in this, instead of one condition, we're gonna have multiple conditions and we're gonna know what's gonna happen in each of those cases. So you can probably provide F case with, with a series of sort of if then conditions. It will go through each of the ifs, find the first one that applies to each observation and then give you the then for that value. Uh, there's also a default operation you can do when everything else fits. So here's an example. So we have that income data, the person year data, um, and I wanna create an income bracket variable. Uh, so, you know, chunking update like this is pretty common when you're cleaning data. So I'm using a not in place operation here. I've got the list. So I want to keep income, right? I could have just said income, but I said income equals income for whatever reason. Uh, income bracket, however, I'm going to use F case. So I'm going to go through a bunch of conditions and check whether each of them is true. So first condition is income less than $50,000. If it is, give me the value under 50K. If that's not true, I'm going to go to the next one. If it, is it above 50,000 and less than 100,000? Well, then if that's true, give me 50 to 100. Is it greater than 100 and less than 12, uh, 120,000? Then give me 100 to 120. Is none of those true? Then give me the default value, which is 100, above 120K. Okay. So I've gone through each of these conditions and I've gotten given the first one. So here we have one that is above 50 and below 100. So it gets to the 50 to 100. Here we have one that none of these was true for. So it gets above 120. Here we have one that's above 100 and less than 120. So this one, that gives the 100 and 120 option. By the way, I actually didn't need this part. And I didn't need this part. Because if I get to this condition in the first place, that means that this one has already failed. So I know that it's above 50,000 already. I don't need to recheck that. I did to make it a little bit clearer as you, as you look at it, but I didn't need that part. I could have just done the income, the income below 100,000 part. Um, Notice, by the way, you don't need to pass a single value. You can have it do a calculation to do a calculation differently. So let's say that I want to adjust things for inflation. I can check which year it is. And based on the year, I can do a uh, manipulation of the data, right? So give me back income, uh, but multiply it by 1.001 if I need to adjust the inflation by one year. And if it's not, if it's in 2015, I don't need to make any adjustments at all. I can just pass back the regular income. Um, you can also use a uh, uh, data table very easily to just change some observations. So it's pretty common, especially when you're cleaning very raw data, that there's just a couple of observations that you need to change. You don't need to recalculate a whole column. You just need to change a few observations. Uh, the data table makes this very, very easy, especially with the in-place operations. Can we just apply a filter and an in-place update? And it will only affect the, uh, the rows that uh, that filter applies to. So let's say that we looked at our person year data and said, hey, uh, David's income is in pounds. I want to convert it to dollars, okay? But only David's. So I'm just going to look at David's data. I'm going to change his income to, to multiply by 1.34 from what it used to be. This will only apply to David's data. Uh, I don't need to do anything else. If you remember the tidyverse version, this was much harder in the tidyverse version, uh, whereas manipulating just some rows is much easier uh, in data table in addition to faster. All right. Any questions about column operations before we move on to grouping? Okay. All right. Our third argument in data table is the by variable, or the by option, uh, which lets us group the data. So when we group data, what it does is it takes our data table and it sort of chunks it into a bunch of little mini data tables based on the groups. Then whatever calculation you do for it, it will do it separately by group, okay? So here's an example. So I got my person year data. I'm gonna do it by person. So I'm gonna do a separate calculation for each person in the data. I'm gonna keep my income regular, and then I'm gonna do income relative to mean, which is gonna be income minus the mean of income, okay? If I did this without the grouping, it would do everybody's income relative to the entire mean of, um, of income, but I don't want to do that. I want to do it relative to their own mean. And that's what the, the by person does. So Ramesh, you can see here in uh, 2014, he's 420.5 below his mean, his own mean. And he's 425.5 above his mean in the next year and so on, right? Uh, we can see if these balance out exactly because we only have two observations for each person. Uh, but we're doing those, those calculations of the mean internally. Excuse me. 
Um, so you can just give the variable name. Uh, you can also give a condition. Uh, you know, you can say in, you know, if you don't have a, a variable by itself that dedicates the groups, you can say, do this separately by income being above 100,000 or not. That also works. Um, you can pass multiple, uh, con multiple variables or conditions as well uh, with a list, just as before, dot A, B, or a set of string uh, variable names. You can't do conditions with this, but uh, uh, you can do C of you know, uh, quote A, quote B. Um, now, the nice thing about, so, so grouping is something you can do with other kinds, with tidyverse, for example. One thing a data table does that's very nice is it has keys. It has set keys for the data tables. So a lot of times, data, the same data table has uh, a set of keys that you use a lot over and over again, right? It has a set of key identifying variables, and you will do a lot of group-based operations based on those. So with data tables, you can set what the keys are. You can tell it what the keys are and it will remember them, which means that the next time you do a grouped operation, it will be much faster. Because when you do a grouped operation, it takes a lot of time because it has to do a couple things. It has to sort by the groups. It needs to separate the data by the groups, and then it needs to do the operation for each group, okay? If you set the keys, it will remember what the keys are and what the groups are. It will keep the data table sort of split. And those first two steps don't need to be repeated. You can just skip straight to calculating the group, the group uh, calculation. So it'll be a lot faster the second time you do it. So uh, instead of using by, you can use key by. And what that will do is it will do your calculation with groups, uh, and then it will remember those groups. And then the next time you do a group-based operation, it will remember that and it will do it much faster. Uh, you can also use set key to set the key uh, in place. Uh, so this is a very good idea, especially if you're, if you're working with large data, and especially if you're going to use the same keys over and over. All right, so that's how we can do grouping. Why is grouping useful? Grouping is useful for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, we want to look for where information is and think about where we want it to be, right? We want to move data around. Uh, grouping is a very good way of moving information from one row to another, which can be very difficult otherwise. Uh, it can also let us change the observational. If we have, let's say, person year data, and I just want to know, you know, I don't really care how their income changes from year to year. I just want to know in general, what's their income? Well, I can change that person year data to just person data using grouping. I can say, hey, group by person and then take the mean of income. And now suddenly I've got just one row per person uh, for income. Um, some handy tips, uh, by the way, uh, the dot N variable inside of a column operation will tell you the number of rows in the group that you're working with, which can be handy. Uh, and sequel, uh, sequence length of dot n gives you the row number uh, within that observation. So let's see sort of that in action. So here uh, I'm going to take my person year data and I'm going to squash it down to just the person data. Okay. So I'm going to use not in place here. So I got the list. Uh, I'm going to get mean income, which is just the mean of income. And I've got the number of years that I'm tracking this person for, which is dot n, just the number of observations that I have for each person. Now, this is going to give me back one observation per person because I have specified a by person calculation. And each of the variables that I've given it will give me back only one observation per group. Right. Uh, so if I had kept in here like income equals income, I would get back the original size of the data with one row per thing. Because if I ask for the income variable, it's going to have one row per person per year. Right? And we'll just default to the longest thing that you give it. But here, I'm not asking for income to be saved. I just want the mean of income, which is going to be one, one mean per person, uh, and the number of rows, which is one number of rows per person. Uh, and it will give me back the mean income and the number of years I'm tracking each person. Right? So I can use it to go from a broader or a, a more specific uh, observation level to a squashed one. I will note that using the walrus operator uh, or an in-place manipulation will never change the observation level. It will always keep the original observation level uh, no matter what you do. So if you want to do a grouped operation and make sure that you keep the original observation level, you definitely want to use in-place uh, manipulation. All right, uh, sorting data tables. We can sort our data very easily. Uh, you can sort in place, which is usually how I will do it. Just use the set order function, give it the data, give it the variables you want to sort by, it will do it. Pretty simple. You can also uh, use the the row order, the the the, the i option or the i argument here. Uh, pass it in an order variable or an order function, 
and that will do it. But I've never, I don't, I never actually do that. I just use set order. It's faster and easier. All right, <laughs> that is the details on our sort of data table uh, operations. There's a couple more things to go with it, but that's sort of the basics of going from tidy data to our analysis data. Uh, any, any questions about any of that? Um, I, I do have a question about um, when you group the data um, yeah. in data tables. So I'm just thinking about when I've grouped data, um, I think in tidyverse, Sometimes I would want to, depending on the groups, I would want to do like a quick visualization of it. Um, can, can you do the same thing here? Like, so I, I maybe I've grouped my data and then I want to do just like, I don't know, um, just any kind of chart or something to just like see it, the what the groupings look like visually. Do you like pipe it to a visualization? Yeah, you can totally thing? pipe it to, you know, a ggplot or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's say, for example, um, I want to check, um, What's the different miles per gallon for the different uh, kinds of cylinders? That's what I'm going to do. So I might do this. I might say uh, uh, empty cars, um, MPG equals mean MPG by cylinders. And then I can pipe this to ggplot. I just need to load ggplot, don't I? Yeah, not that. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Any, oh, any other questions? Um, one other weird thing that I will point out about data table is that it doesn't always play super nicely with R markdown. The in-place manipulation sort of uh, confuses R markdown sometimes. Um, there are two ways around this. One is to continually reference your data table inside your R Markdown document. So just sort of remind R Markdown what you're working with uh, to let it update its references. Um, that's one thing that you can do. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can set R Markdown to, to run in the global environment, uh, which if that's something you're interested in doing, then I would just recommend Googling it. I'm not going to be able to tell you how to do it here, but it, it's not that difficult. Um, basically, uh, I guess I can tell you how to do it. Uh, in R Markdown, uh, there's the... Um, Markdown render function. So typically in our markdown, you would click knit, right? Simple enough. Uh, however, um, uh, you can also just do the render function. Knit just runs the, the render function and you can tell it the file to render. And you can also tell it the environment to run it in. And if you run it in the global environment, uh, then uh, I think it's just global. And then it will run properly. Um, although that this doesn't always is not always a problem. I mean, I made these slides in R Markdown with data table and it just worked fine. Uh, so sometimes it, it, it'll give you problems, sometimes it won't. All right. So uh, we've got our basic idea of how we can do these sort of manipulations to get our data tidy. We, when we're doing this though, we need to think about what are those actual operations that we're gonna run. And for that, we're gonna need to think about the kinds of variables that we have to deal with. Um, and uh, a lot of data cleaning is making an already tidy data set work, uh, usable. So as I mentioned, for example, before we had that tax data that we you know, shaped into tidy format, but everything was in characters as opposed to numbers. We need to change that. So like that's the kind of thing we need to worry about we're thinking about variable types. There are four sort of very common variable types that you're likely to run into uh, when you're cleaning data, uh, numeric data, character string data, factor data, and dates. So uh, what can we do with data or with, uh, with variable types? One thing you can check what kind of variable types you have. Uh, there's a bunch of is dot functions for any sort of uh, type of variable that you can imagine, like is character a three. You know, two. two is a number, not a character, so that's false, right? So you can check it with is. Uh, there's also, um, you can use vtable, as I mentioned. vtable will show us the variable types that we have under class here. Uh, class in general will show us 
what kind of variable that we're working with. Um, and uh, if you want to check the types of all the variables, uh, there's a couple of things you can do. One is you can use the table like this. Uh, another is you can do uh, uh, either map or S supply. You can say uh, empty cars. Yeah. Uh, class. And it will show you the classes of all the different variables that you have. Um, so we have, we can check what kind of type of variable we have, which is a good idea. So you know what you're working with. Um, you can also convert between types using the as functions. So I had that tax data before. I want to change it into different types of data. So I had some, some uh, character variables for AGI deductible income. I want to make those numeric. I can just use some in-place manipulation. I can use as.numeric to change the income variable that's a character into a, new, a number, same thing with deductible, same thing with AGI. I'm going to change this person variable into a factor for some reason. Um, and uh, it will do all those things for me. And then here I'm just checking the class S supply works in addition to map. Um, and it's showing me that now I have numeric data and a factor variable. So notes on working with numeric data. Uh, numeric data comes in multiple formats based on the type of level precision. Uh, integers are just whole numbers, doubles go a little bit further. There's floats, goes on. Uh, generally, you don't need to worry about this too much. Uh, R will just sort of you do it for you. You know, if you need, if you, you try to, you know, take a whole number and divide it by two, it'll be like, oh, I guess this isn't an integer anymore. I'll change the type. Um, one common problem that you will run into uh, is that if you are reading in data, especially from a CSV file, uh, and it's got very long numbers, like let's say 16 digits, 17 digits, which might commonly happen if you've got, let's say, an ID variable, right? So let's say, for example, you've got a data set, uh, and that data set has somebody's like customer ID number, and it's like an 18 digit number. Right. Uh, well, it's going to read that in. It's going to say, oh, man, this number is really long. You probably don't need all 18 digits, do you? I'm just going to tell, you know, instead of 1876532, blah, 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 I'm going to do 1.8 times 10 to the 18th power. Right. That's all the information you really needed. Right. Well, no, then your data doesn't work and your code doesn't work anymore because it's going to confuse all the different IDs that start with 1.8. Uh, to avoid this, uh, you might want to specify that those long variables are being read in as characters, as strings. Uh, you can do this uh, with options like in uh, the call classes argument uh, in the fread function. fread is a uh, data table function for reading in CSV files. It is astonishingly quick. Uh, even if you learn nothing else about data table, you should be using fread to read in CSV files because it's just super fast. Uh, and there's a call classes argument here that you can use to specify what type of variable each thing that you're reading in is. So that's... That's numbers. <laughs> uh, the, a lot of times, the, the, diff, the variables that are going to give us difficulties are going to be strings or dates. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, strings in R. Uh, we can specify strings in R with either single quotes or double quotes. Those both work fine. Uh, we can use paste uh, or paste zero to stick stuff together. Uh, so for example, paste zero, here's an H, here's an LO. I'm going to specify the separation uh, operator being an underscore, and that will give us H underscore LO. It's combining together the H and the LO with the underscore separating everything in between. Uh, paste comes in handy a lot. Uh, the difference between paste and paste zero, by the way, the only difference is that the default option for sep is uh, a space in paste. And in paste zero, it's just a blank. It's nothing. Uh, so I, I use paste zero sort of by default myself. Um, but if you're specifying sep, it doesn't matter. Uh, one thing to note is that often uh, it's, it's pretty common for when you're reading in messy data that it will default to character because that can sort of incorporate most kinds of data. Uh, so you might, for example, get read in a, a data set and it will have this number in it in Excel and it might get read in as one comma zero 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 comma zero zero zero, which is not a number, uh, which you might have to manipulate a little bit to get into a numerical format. We'll talk about that in a second. Factor variables are categorical data. When you have something that can be one of several options, uh, you will probably want to store it as a factor variable. It is going to be a lot more uh, uh, memory efficient to store it that way. Uh, so for example, I had those uh, income brackets before. So I made those income brackets. And here I'm going to specify that to be a factor variable. Uh, I'm just going to wrap it in a factor function. I'm going to tell it what levels it has. So the nice thing about factor variables, they can be uh, uh, ordered. So here, less than 50K is less than 50 to 100K is less than 100K plus. And so if I sort the data on income, it will do it properly. If I had not done this factor thing, it would try to sort it in alphabetical order, which would be different. It'd be 50K, then 100K, then less than 50K. Don't want that. Dates. Dates are terrible. Uh, and you, They're in a lot of data, and they're always awful. 
Uh, I'm not going to go super de into detail on them because they're just pretty awful. Um, but I would recommend that you can fix you can fix most problems that you have with dates using the Lubra date package. Uh, it's got stuff like converting between date time variables and date variables, uh, adding a month onto a variable. Uh, so, for example, let's say that I got a date. Uh, so Lubra date. You know, let's say I have a date. Let's say year month date uh, 2020 uh, January 15th. Great, so that's a date. Great. What is a month later? Well, uh, I, I can just do plus months one, and that is one month later than that day. Uh, and it can be smart about it too. Like, let's say that I want to know what's hey, what's a month later from the thirty first of January? Is it February thirty first? That doesn't exist, and it will it will know that that doesn't exist, right? So it can be smart about it. So uh, my answer for your difficulties in working with dates is usually just use Lubridate. Uh, and figure out what function in there is, is, is applicable for you. And there's, there's a nice cheat sheet here, and it will probably cover most of the cases that you're going to see. All right. I am going to talk more in detail about character variables and string variables because they come up a lot in data cleaning, especially if you're working with data that's messier to start, because often you'll get data that is stored, that data that is not it's string data, but is stored in string format for some reason. You know, for example, here, uh, you know, I, I would read in this number right here. That's going to be a string because it's got a dollar sign in. Dollar sign is not a number. Uh, or this phone number, right? That's a number, but it's got the letters F P H uh, or P H O N E colon in front of it. So that's not a number. That's a string. It's going to read this whole thing in as a string. I'm going to need to clean it if I want to turn it into a number. Uh, so um, some of these fixes are straightforward. So, for example, you know, if you just want to fix a couple of typos in there, you can just say, hey, here's the line where the typo is. And there, I'm going to fix it, right? Using in-place manipulation, super easy. Um, there are lots of other common tasks in data cleaning with strings. Uh, we're going to be using the string R package. Both Lubridate and string R are part of the tidyverse, by the way. Um, but I use them with data table all the time because uh, they just have some handy functions in there. So let's start with getting substrings. Uh, so let's say that we're working with uh, something like nested IDs. We want to just pick some characters out of there. Uh, you want to pick a particular part of a string. Or for example, in this data, I know that all when I start picking out the phone numbers, it's going to start P-H-O-N-E colon blank and then the number. I only want the parts that are after those first seven characters, right? So how can I do that? Well, you can use str sub which you give it a string, you tell it what character position to start at, you tell it what character position to end at, and it will give that to you. So if you do uh, stir sub hello, and you say two to four, it's going to give you the second, third, and fourth character, which are ELL. -L, right? uh, you can also use negative values to read from the end of the string. So stir sub hello of negative one is just O. Notice I don't need the last argument here. If I want it to just go all the way to the end of the string, I can just give it nothing. Uh, I can get so, so getting substrings, how can that come up? Uh, so here I might do str sub eight and then to the end, and that would give me the phone number, right? Uh, here's another example. Here I've got some census block group indicators. So a census block group is a geographic uh, uh, area that you live in. So you live in a state, that's your, that's your, set, your state FIPS code. So this is uh, state one, which I can't remember what that is. I think that might be, no, it's not Washington. Uh, Maine, I forget. Anyway, uh, inside of that state, you live in a county. Here's your county code. Uh, inside that county code, you live in a census block uh, group. And then you have a census block group tracked inside of that. So this is, this is a geographic way of splitting up the United States that the census uses. Uh, and so roughly the size of a city block if you live in the city. Um, now, I want to take these census block group values, which are being read in as numbers here, and I want to pull out those state and county indicators. So I can tell what county you live in, okay? So how can I do this? So for one, I'm gonna first turn it into a string variable so I can work with, right? These are numbers, uh, so I want it to be strings. So one thing to notice is that as these are numbers, this leading zero, that's gonna get dropped. So I'm gonna have two numbers in here. Here's gonna be one of the numbers, and here's gonna be another one of the numbers, okay? And I wanna get the, st the state code, which is the first two characters here. And I want to get the county code, which are the third through fifth characters. So I'm going to use F case here because I'm going to want to do something different depending on whether there is a leading zero or not, because this leading zero is going to get dropped, right? If I do this, here's a number. It will drop that leading zero. If I do as character of that number, it will still have dropped that leading zero, OK? 
Okay. Uh, so uh, here, if the if the uh, the string has twelve characters in it, that tells me that it had, that there was a leading zero that got dropped. So I'd only want the first character here, going from one, the first place to the second place. If it's thirteen, then I want from the first place to the second place. Right. So now there I've ex I've extracted your uh, your census block group state. This should give me uh, one and ten, and there's one and ten. Uh, do I use string pattern here? I don't. That's criminal. Okay. Another good way to do this when you have a leading zero problem, uh, which is actually especially handy if you're working with months uh, or in, in days, is a function called string pad. Also in the string R package. Uh, so another way that I could do this whole process here, instead of the F case, is I could say, OK, I've got my as character here. right? I've dropped that leading 0. I want it back. Well, I can just tell it to pad out the string until it's the correct length again. So I can say CBG data, I want my CBG variable, string pad, take my CBG variable. I want it to be 13 wide because they all should be 13 wide. It's only 12 because I dropped it leading zero. Uh, add to the left, add a zero until you get to something that's 13 wide. So now CBG data, you can see that I have filled in that leading zero and it stayed there because it's a string, right? If it was still a number, it would have dropped it, but it's a string, so it kept it. So now I can do CBG data state FIPS is string sub cbg one two i don't have to, i don't have to bother with the f case as i mentioned this is really handy when you're working with uh with months so let's say that you have a date so ymd 2020 uh what day is date? oh two oh five great so there's my date and i have uh i want to get a month out of there what month is it oh it's month two great well what if i want to write that month back out well if i do that it's going to be it's, I, I want my month to have two digits or a two digit month, right? There's a lot of things I don't want to do that with. I want to do a folder structure according to the month. Uh, maybe I want to write, uh, print out the month and I want zero two instead of two. Well, I can just do string pad, str, pad, month, uh, make it too wide, put it on the left and give me a leading zero, oh two. All right, another handy uh, string operation is string split. Uh, this is especially useful when you're going from records because often there'll be multiple pieces of information put in the same cell of data that you can split on. Uh, so for example, if you have this string right here, A comma B, and you string split it on the comma, uh, it and then pick the, it will give you back a list. Usually that list just has one element in it, so you pick the first element of that list. And this will give me A and then B as separate elements. It will have split them on the comma, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, conveniently, you can use this to, to split apart a column of multiple variables into multiple columns. So here is an example of a data set that has um, uh, different departments, uh, and but they're squashed together. So this row is sales and marketing. This one is H&R and marketing. I want to separate those out. So I can just create two new variables, category one and category two, by string splitting the category on that comma, and it will do it properly for me right there. All right, we might also want to commonly clean strings. Uh, there's a couple of uh, common operations that I use when I'm cleaning strings. One is trim and squash. Uh, trim just removes extra white space from the beginning and end of strings. Uh, this is especially handy if you are you know, separating things out or if you just read in some raw data, often there's some blank spaces on either side. Uh, squish will remove the white space on either side. And also if there's multiple spaces in the middle, it will also remove those. So here we have uh, space, high, double space, hello, space. If we string trim that, we're gonna get those spaces on the either side, those are gonna go away. If I string, uh, string squish instead, it will also get rid of that double space in the middle, replace it with a single space. Another one that I use a lot is string replace or string replace all. Uh, the difference being that string replace only does the first one that it comes to. String replace all will do all of them. And this one looks for a particular string and then replaces it with another string. Uh, one place where this comes up is the problem that I mentioned where you have numbers that have commas in them. Well, I can just use string replace all, look in the number variable, 
wherever you find a comma, replace it with nothing. And then one, the result that I have should be something that I can convert to a number. And I get numbers without the commas in them and they're actual numbers. All right, a lot of this centers around detecting patterns in strings. Uh, so, you know, when we're, when we're doing this, what we're looking for is we're saying, hey, look for a comma, right? But I can do something more complex than that as well. For that, I'm going to need to use something called regular expressions, which is a very vast and complex thing uh, that I'm not going to go into in super detail here because there's, I mean, there's just a lot to go over. I mean, you could read a whole book on this stuff. Um, but here's a guide that I've linked here, which can help you out with doing those in R. Um, so uh, uh, you can do things like, hey, look for any number, look for any letter, look for a bunch of stuff in a row, right? Um, so here's an I'm going to just do, do a quick example of this. Uh, so let's say I have some data that has a company name and then a ticker uh, symbol, and I want to get rid of the ticker symbol, okay, with string replace all, and find the ticker symbol and get rid of it. I can't just put in the ticker symbol because there's a bunch of different ticker symbols for the different rows of my data. But I can just look for generically what a ticker symbol looks like. What does a ticker symbol look like? Like this. What is that? Well, this is saying, look for a parentheses, an open parentheses. That double backslash is saying, hey, that parentheses, that, that usually has special meaning in a regular expression, but I want you to actually look for an actual parentheses. Once you found an uh, a parentheses, I want you to look for a capital letter. Okay. Uh, then I want you to look for a bunch of capital letters. Keep looking for capital letters. Then look for another parentheses. If you find all of this stuff, an open parentheses, followed by a bunch of capital letters, followed by a closed parentheses. That's what a stock ticker looks like. And once you find that, I want you to get rid of it. Okay. So let's see that here. So here I've created a data, a data table with two different uh, settings. In it. I've got Amazon, AMZN holdings, and I've got Cargill Corp with a parenthetical that I guess makes some sort of sense. Uh, so what am I going to do here? Uh, so I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to check if it's publicly listed. So if it's got a ticker symbol, I'm going to say it's publicly listed. And I want to get rid of the ticker symbol. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is, uh, oh, hey, what's this? Like. What is like? That is a data table specific string operation that just says, hey, uh, does this string, does, do we find this pattern in this string? Uh, and if we do return true, if we don't return false. Uh, so here it's going to look in each of these strings for that pattern that I was looking for open parentheses, capital letters, close parentheses. If I find it, that's a publicly, list, publicly listed firm, which is true of Amazon, not true of Cargo. Uh, even though I had the parentheses, it did not find the capital letter afterwards. So it said, no, this is not it. Then I'm going to do the same thing, but with string replace. I'm going to say, hey, look for that uh, stock ticker thing. If you find it, remove the stock ticker thing. And then that's what we have. We've gotten rid of the AMZN, but we've left the cool place. All right, any questions? on any of these variable type manipulations, in particular, the string operations. Those are the kind of things that you're going you're gonna to run into a lot over and over again. All right. I know we've been going for a while, but we, are, we only have a couple short sections left. All right. So uh, one thing that pops up a lot in data cleaning is using the data structure to move pieces of information around. Uh, so uh, uh, we want to take information from where it is, move it to where we want it to be. Uh, and this can be very tricky uh, when working with tidy data because often we want to move data from where it is to a different row, and that can be difficult to target. Uh, this can be necessary when you're changing observation level. It can be doing, you're doing things like calculating growth from an initial point. Um, we can do this with functions like first, last, and shift. So let's talk about those right here. So first and last refer to the first and last row of your data, naturally. Uh, when you combine this with by, it means the first or last row of the data in that group. Okay. So let's say I've got some Amazon stock ticker data. I've got some Walmart stock ticker data here. I've got some dates. Uh, and I want to know uh, how has the stock price grown since March 4th? So what am I going to do? So I've got my data. I'm going to sort it by ticker and then date. And so when I do this, here's what it's going to look like. All right? I just sorted it by date. Now I want to calculate growth since the fourth. I just need to compare, let's say, this value to this value up here. Right? How much has it grown since then? So I'm going to do an in-place operation. I'm going to take whatever stock price is on the current row. I'm going to divide it by the first stock price that I see, which happens to be March fourth here. 
and then subtract one to get a percentage growth. I'm going to do it by ticker. So it's going to do each of these tickers separately. And then here's what we get, right? So the uh, stock price has grown by 0.3 percentage points since the day before. Uh, this one has grown by 3.8 percentage points since two days before, right? And so on. Right? You can see how it's calculating relative to this one. So we're using data structure to, to refer one row to another. Uh, shift is similar, except instead of looking at the first or last row, it just looks at rows relative to the current position. Okay, So for example, if I want to look one row above, I would use shift to shift where I'm looking one row above or one row below or two rows above or however many I want. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, this does not care about time structure, only the data structure. So if you want to know, like, say, hey, do it from one year ago then uh, that's not probably going to be your tool <laughs> unless you always know that one year ago is one row above or something like that. So, uh, oh, I said lag here. That should, that should say shift. Um, but uh, uh, so what am I doing here? So here I'm doing uh, uh, growth since the day before. So I'm doing uh, stock price divided by, this should say shift, stock price of one where I'm shifting one above uh, by ticker. So here I'm comparing uh, this to the row above it. So uh, since March 4th, it's been 0.38 percentage points. And also since the day before, March 4th, it's been 0.38 percentage points. Uh, here I'm looking, again, one row above it. How much has it, has it grown since yesterday, which has been 0.35%, okay. uh, or 3.5%, right? So we're looking one row above. You can use this to do some trickier stuff as well. Uh, so, for example, let's say that you want to pick out a row to compare to, but it's not the first or the last row. Well, you just need to arrange things differently. So if I wanted to compare, let's say, to the fifth instead of the fourth, even though the fourth is the first date in my data, I just need to, you know, uh, let's say, create a new variable that indicates the date, the, the date that I want, and then arrange according to that, right? Set order so that the fifth is on the top as opposed to the fourth, and then refer to the first row. Um, you can also, in general, create a new column that only has the data that you want, and then refer and then sort on that and refer to that. So let's let's do an example of that. Okay, so here's some more complex data. Uh, so I've got different people; uh, they've taken different tests in different grades on different subjects. Okay, and what I want to do is I want for each person I want to know for whatever grade they're currently in, what is the average math score in that grade. So I want to get just math scores, and I want to aggregate those over grade. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to create a new data, a new variable that only has math scores. Okay, so let's let's do that here. Let's see what this looks like. So I've, uh, you can see that if it's math, the subject is math. I've pulled that score out. And if it's not math, I've left it blank. N a n a n a n a. Right. Uh, now I can get an average of just the math scores by just taking the mean of the math scores and ignoring all the other scores. This will only get the math data. It will ignore everything else. And that will be stored in math average in this grade, uh, which you can see here. So this person's in sixth grade. The average math score in sixth grade is 80. This person's also in sixth grade. They took an English test, but I can still see that the average math score in sixth grade is 80. All right, any questions on the data structure stuff? All right, the last section, automation. Uh, so data cleaning is often very repetitive and your goal is to make it not repetitive, both for your own sanity, uh, but also because it will make sure that you make fewer errors. Uh, so there are a bunch of different ways that you can automate your data cleaning process. Uh, there's gonna be three that we're gonna talk about here. Uh, one is the use of SD columns. Uh, one is writing functions. And then the last one is per, which we've already done a little bit with before. So let's start with SD. So uh, often you will want to use this, do the same operation to many different columns. So for example, a while ago, we wanted to convert all of our columns to numeric, right? Do we really have to write out this column equals as numeric that name? This column equals as numeric. This column equals as numeric, blah, 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 blah. No, we don't. We can use SD columns. SD refers to an entire set of data being analyzed uh, other than any of the variables in by, or you can specify columns yourself. Uh, if you pass this to L apply, uh, which is basically iterating over something but with a list, um, you can apply a certain function to every variable uh, right there. So we can also specify SD calls to only do particular variables. Uh, we used patterns before to specify groups of variables. We can do that with SD calls as well. 
in the column operations, the dot sd uh, thing is basically referring to the entire set of variables that you've just passed in, which doesn't make isn't doesn't seem super clear, but maybe it'll be clearer here. So I'm going to take empty cars. I want to get the mean of every variable. How can I do that? I can just say, hey, sd, that's the entire set of variables. Give me the mean of every single one of those variables. Right? There's the mean function in there, and I'm L applying to loop over all the different SD columns, and I get the mean of every single variable there. Uh, I can do it with a more complex function like this. Right? I can say L apply, just add one to each of those columns. Notice, by the way, this is not in place. Uh, so I have not actually done in place changes here. I'm just adding one to each and seeing what it looks like. Uh, you can specify just a few columns to do this with instead of all of the columns. Uh, so for example, uh, on the next slide, I'm going to use patterns price growth. It's going to iterate over just the price growth named columns. Um, so here's an example. So I had that stock data before that at Amazon and Walmart. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two new variables, okay, called uh, BPS March 4, BPS daily. I'm going to use in place assignment. Uh, I'm going to use L apply with SD. I'm going to take each of those variables and I'll multiply them by 10,000 to turn them from uh, percentages to basis points. And I only want to do it to the price growth variable. So I'm going to use SD calls to specify which variables are in the SD here. And I'm going to do it to the price growth variables. So I had price growth since March 4th. I had price growth daily. These are the variables I'm going to affect. I'm going to create BPS March 4th, BPS daily based on those variables, which is just multiplying each of them by 10,000. And that's what I have here. Uh, ah, if you want to get real complex, you can do multiple functions at once with a C and a vector, but if that's too complex for me. I don't, I don't bother with that. I just do multiple different uh, uh, commands. Uh, here's another example of this where I'm using uh, uh, the index numbers four and five, right? So this is the, the uh, we have the four and five uh, columns here. I'm creating new uh, variables here, right? You can see I'm, I'm doing multiple functions at once. So I'm creating four new variables, BPS March 4, BPS daily, percent March 4, percent daily, the basis points multiplies by 10,000, the percentage multiplies by 100. You can see what we get here. Um, you might also want to convert a bunch of variables of the same type, right? SD calls could also be used like this. Uh, you could, you know, do L apply as numeric, and it would turn all the variables that you specify in SD calls to numeric variables. All right, more automation, row-wise operations. Uh, one thing, the common thing that you see in business data is, let's say you have, you know, sales uh, revenues, marketing revenues, uh, et cetera, revenues, and you want to add them all up. But there's a lot of variables, so you don't want to specify writing out the, all of the variable names uh, right there. That would be just too much work. Uh, SD can help there as well, especially if you just want to sum because you can just use the row sums function. Uh, so what I mean by this, so here's a data set. We have different years. We have the sales um, uh, spending in each of those years, marketing spending, R&D spending. I want to add all three of those up without having to type out sales, marketing, R&D. I can use SD calls and another way of specifying variable names. I can use sales to R and D that will pick all the variable name or all the variables from sales to R and D in our data. I will pass that to SD calls so that SD over here will sum over those variables using row sums, and I will get the total spending, which you can see adds up those three uh, columns right there. Any questions about the SD stuff? Okay, another handy thing for automating your stuff is, of course, to write functions. Uh, so we've already done a little bit of this, uh, actually, uh, but uh, we're going to do a little bit more. Uh, so function writing in R is fairly straightforward. You are each each function is an object in itself, so you're assigning a function to be an object. Uh, the function function <laughs> takes uh, the different arguments that you want to put into the function. So if I want to be able to set argument one and argument two, I can do that here. Um, the defaults are what you get uh, if you don't specify those arguments. Uh, and then inside of your function, which we usually put in curly braces, we can run some code, we can save our result, and then we can return the result. And that is what we get back out of the function. And every function in R looks like this on the inside. 
using functions is a good idea. It makes your code reusable. It saves you a lot of work. Uh, it also reduces errors because instead of just copy pasting code over and over and over again, especially if you want to change something later, you have to go back and change every iteration. No, use a function. You can change it once. Some tips for writing functions. Uh, make sure to think about the kinds of values your function takes in and also puts out so you can be consistent in terms of how you use it. Uh, that's the main tip that I have. Test it out. Make sure that it works properly. Try a bunch of different values. Make sure that it doesn't break uh, after you've written it. Uh, you know, you should be able to handle all the values that you need. And then there's some more information on writing functions uh, in a link here. We don't spend too much time on it. In addition to functions that we save as objects, as I just showed you, we also have something in R called unnamed functions. You notice when we did, for example, the L apply stuff, I did like this, right? I said just function X is X times a thousand. This is called an unnamed function where I haven't saved it. I've just sort of used it here. Um, if your function is very small and you're only going to use it once, this is something that you might want to commonly do. Um, you know, just looks like this. I don't have to, I don't have to save this anywhere. Uh, I could make a multiply by 10,000 function uh, and then put it, I could have used that, but I didn't have to. I just used this unnamed function. Um, uh, in R 4.1, in addition to getting the new pipe, we're also going to get some shorthand for this. You can just do this instead of function X, uh, which will be a lot faster. Okay, the last automation uh, is using more map within PER. Uh, we already used this to read Hi. in the file. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yep. I have a question about function writing. So uh, first of all, um, what are some common things that you write functions for when you're working with the data? Um, I've, I've never written functions in R. So Anything I'm going to do more than once, I'm probably going to write a function for. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say, for example, uh, I have something I want to process different data sets in the same way. I would write a function to do that process, and I'd pass the data sets to that function to get their processing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I would all. I might, I might also commonly write a function if I want to do something special with a column operation. So, for example, let's say I got a, a column of string variables, uh, and I got a couple of different operations I want to do on it. So let, let me do an example. So let's say we got, uh, here's our uh, data table. It's going to be data table. Uh, a variable is going to be um, ABC and then uh, CDM and then uh, like that. Okay. There's my data. So I want to uh, clean this variable. And what I'm, the way that I'm going to clean it is I'm going to, uh, first I want to make sure I want to get rid of all the commas. And then once I've gotten rid of all the commas, I want to count up how many characters there are. And that's going to be my new variable. Okay. So I want to do this to each of these columns, uh, and it'll be easier if I just write a function. So here's my new function, uh, my new function. I'm putting X in here. It could be anything. Well, we can call it string, for, S for string. And I want to do my multiple operations, so I'll put them all in my function. So I'm going to say S, get rid of those commas. So string replace all S comma nothing. And then once I've replaced it, I want to count up the number of characters. So uh, uh, n is going to be n char s. And then I want to return n. Great. That's my new function. Uh, mm -hmm. So it should just work to do uh, num characters new function. Hey, I think that should work. Am I missing something? No, there we go. Right. So uh, iterating over rows is a perfectly valid reason to write a function. If you want to do more than one thing at a time, writing a function is a good way to do it. And so in this case, then um, the difference is instead of having to specify, oh, I want to do this with all the variables I want to do it with, we can do it all at once with this function. And then could we then, if we had multiple data sets that we wanted to do this to, mm -hmm. then just apply that function. And, and then there, then like, kind of going back to my map question earlier, could you use map to iterate through those multiple data sets to apply this function? Yes. Okay, Okay. so that does make a lot of things a lot easier. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry, another question. Is this only av available in data table writing functions? No, data table is an R thing generally. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so uh, map and per. Um, so what map does is it iterates, you pass it something, you pass it a list of something or a vector of something, it iterates over each element of that and does some sort of function to it, whatever function you want it to do. Uh, the, the different, there are multiple different map functions. The main difference in them is what they pass back out. Uh, you, so map by itself will give you a list of results. So whatever you give it, it'll give you back a list. So if you give it a list of, uh, or a, a vector of file names, you tell it to read all of them, it'll give you back a list 
of file name, of files having been read, having read them in. Uh, map double will give you back num a vector of numbers. Map character will give you back a vector of characters. Map DF will, will try to give you back a, a data frame where each row is the result uh, in, in the, that you've iterated over. Um, lots of different things that you can do. Uh, so uh, here's an example. Um, as I mentioned, each da a data table is just a, a list of uh, columns. So if I want to check the class of each column, uh, I can map do map character. It will go through each column. It will check the class of that column, and then it will give me back the result as a character vector since I said map character. Uh, this is handy for processing many files, as we gave for, as an example. Uh, it can also be uh, handy if you've got, let's say, uh, a function you want to run just on a bunch of different stuff, right? Uh, so let's say I've created a new function called summary profile. Uh, that I want to check each state's data to see if the data looks right. Uh, and so what I can do, I can do this. I can say, hey, take this data set. Give me the state variable. Now, if you remember, I'm not putting this in a list here, so it's going to give me the actual variable itself, uh, not the, a data table that just has that one column. Then I want to take that state variable. I want to pass it to the unique function. This will give me back just the, the list of unique states that I have included in my data. Then for each state, run the summary profile function. Right, so now it's going to give me the summary profile for each state using map. Uh, usually, this is a bit easier to work with than a for loop, and a bit faster too. All right, any questions on automation? Uh, just one question: You said that this would attempt to give you back a data frame, or it would try to. Does that mean it's the, the map DF one will? Okay, uh, sorry, the map DF. So with map DF, does that mean? it might not always be successful. I mean, just because you use the word, it will try to give you back a data frame. Um, I've just found it to be a little fiddly. Um, okay. So a, a number of things have to go right for it to give you back a data frame. Uh, okay. Generally, it will work though if, if the function that you're passing it to will give back a data frame. So it's sort of like, um, remember, so way back when we were reading in files, we passed it a bunch of Excel sheets, we had it read all of them in, and then we afterwards we told it to our bind list, right? Uh, map DF would basically do the R bind listing for you, or at oh. least it would attempt to. But if that didn't work, it would fail, right? So maybe maybe one of the Excel sheets, you know, has different variables entirely, and it can't be R binded. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. So finishing up. Uh, so some final notes. So one, obviously we can't cover everything. Uh, so just a couple notes about, about saving your data. I mentioned using F read to read in CSV files. How can you save data once you're finished with it? Uh, in R, there are two main ways to save data uh, sets. Uh, one is just the save function, which actually can save many objects all at once. So if you want to save a bunch of stuff all from sort of the same workspace, save is a good way to do it. Then once you load that object back in, uh, it will load all of those objects in with the original names that they have. Usually, if I'm using, if I'm saving a single data set, I will not do that. I will instead use the save RDS function, uh, which saves a single data frame in a heavily compressed format, a very, a very efficiently stored data. Um, and the thing that I like about it is, with load, it comes, every, all the data comes back to you um, in your environment with the original names that it had, which for me is, at least if you're programming, is going to be very uh, inconvenient. Whereas read RDS just reads the data in as a normal object, then you store it as whatever data as whatever name you want to give it, right? Uh, so I, I prefer read RDS if I'm just saving a single data set. Um, that said, there are some downsides to it. Like if you use save and then you go to the file that you found and you double click it, it will open properly in R. The save RDS one will try to do the same thing, but it won't work. Uh, you need to actually use the save the read RDS function to read it back in. Uh, for saving data for for sharing with other people. Uh, F right will make it a CSV file, and you know that's good. Other thing to note: please document your data. Please, as you're working with it, make sure that you you know have a description somewhere of what each variable means and what the values of it are and how it's scaled and things like that. At the very least, you want to keep a spreadsheet as you're working that has a description of all the variables in your data. Uh, you can also use the uh, SJ labeled or Haven packages to add what are called variable labels where the, uh, the description of each variable will be stored in the data set itself. Uh, this is very handy. Uh, and then if you're using VTable and you, you use it on your data, it will list out the descriptions. So you can have a little documentation right there next to your data as you're actually working with it. 
All right, that brings us to the walkthrough. So we can actually, so I have, I have some example data here that we can walk through uh, and try to clean. Um, I don't know how up for it you're feeling. You might be a little tired and done. Uh, let's see, maybe some, some hand, show of hands if you'd like me to, uh, to do some data walkthrough. I can also just show you the files and you can try some of this stuff out yourself instead. Who, who would like me to, uh, to do the data walkthrough? I would. All right. Same here. All right, cool. All right, so I'm going to do it. Uh, we'll at least get some started on it. If you, if, you are, if you are done, if you don't want to stick around for this, thank you for coming. Uh, uh, I, I, I won't fault you for leaving. Um, I will uh, also, e if you would like me to email you the, the video, even uh, though you're already here, uh, just let me know if send me an email or something like that. Okay, so let's, first of all, I'm going to show you where the, uh, the data is. Add the Zoom toolbar. Yeah, so if you go to this website right here, it's got the files uh, for the example walkthrough. It's also got the uh, answer code from the Tidyverse version. Come on, chat. Oop, not that. Alt H. Why is the chat so hard to show? There it is. Okay. Yeah, send me an email if you want me to email you the video um, uh, so, I will, so that I will remember. <laughs> so I put a link in the description there um, to uh, this, this, uh, this GitHub repo. You can, if you click download code in a zip file, uh, it will download all the code for you so you can start walking through some of these things yourself. Um, but uh, let's take a look at what we have. Okay, so what we have is a bunch of folders of data. So this is data that I had for a project of my own, uh, and it links together a bunch of stuff. Uh, and what it links together is it's trying to look at the relationship between COVID case rates and uh, whether and how how extensively colleges shut down in fall 2020. Uh, and it links together a bunch of stuff. So it's got iPads data. iPads is uh, college level data from the government. Uh, so it's got descriptions of stuff like, you know, what's the tuition at this college? Uh, what's its endowment? Uh, is it private or public? What's its enrollment? That sort of stuff. Uh, I've got New York Times data, which includes stuff like mask use and also uh, county case rates, at the county level. EADA has information on whether a college is in division one sports or what kind of sports division it has. I've got census data here, uh, which includes things like population at the county level, uh, and then also how rural each county is. Uh, I've got, what else? I guess that's all of it. Um, oh, and then I've also got uh, this uh, foot traffic data here, which I've already compiled from elsewhere, which uh, includes information on how many people were on campus, basically on a given day, um, using cell phone uh, location data. Um, so, uh, first thing we're going to do, figure out what does our data look like? What do we want it to look like? So we want to basically combine all of these data sets together, right? That's our goal. Uh, and so we need to figure, we, we're going to have a lot of merging ahead of us. Uh, we want to incorporate some data. So we've got two iPads files. We have iPads 2018, uh, which has stuff like how, how many people are in distance education and uh, what share of their revenues come from tuition. Uh, we've got 2019, which tells us whether the college is private. We have uh, the Division I status from EADA. Uh, we have our county case rates from the New York Times. Uh, we have the county population in 2019 from the census. Uh, we have, oh, right, from a from package, we have um, the congressional uh, ideology scores uh, for, the, for Congress people in a given area. Uh, and then we have our foot traffic panel as well. We want to merge all of these things together. So to start, we got to figure out what our data looks like. That's our step number one. So let's start by looking at those iPads files, just see what we got. Uh, so we have oh right uh, six six two is our uh, 2018 file. So these are stata data sets, which is a different uh, statistics package, which is the format these happen to be. In. So let's just look at our data, see what it looks like. So we have a unit ID, 
So that might be an ID that we might be able to merge on something. Uh, we have institution name, maybe we can merge on that. We have the year of the data. We have a bunch of different variable names that are not uh, particularly informative, except that we see over here, we have variable labels like we could get with Haven or uh, SJ labeled. So if we want to get, uh, let's see here, percent in distance education, say, okay, well, where's distance education? Uh, distance, percent in distance education. So that's PCT. Uh, D E E X C, P C T D E S O M, P C T D E N O N, and so on. Okay, so that's good. Let's actually load in the data to R here. We can look at it here. So let's say iPads 2018. Uh, so we need Haven. The Haven uh, package has uh, functions for reading and state of files. We're also, of course, going to need data table. So we're going to do read stata. So we've got iPads, and our 2018 data. OK, uh, so we have our iPads 2018. There we go. And you can see it's it's maintained those variable labels up here. And if we do the table, it's going to show us. Here's the variable names, here's the labels, here's the number of missing observations, here's some uh, summary statistics. Um, okay, so we, we want those PCT, DESOM. Uh, so let's go ahead and select those. Um, so first of all, it's, we're gonna be working in data table. So let's turn this into a as data table. There we go. Uh, so let's pick our variables. So we thought that maybe a unit ID and installation name uh, were gonna be useful for merging. So let's just pick those. And then the PCT DESOM. So let's do uh, unit ID, uh, institution name. And let's see if we can use patterns to pick those PCT uh, DE distance education variables. I'm actually not sure if this is going to work. Let's see if it works. It doesn't. But patterns. No. Ah, alas, doesn't work. Okay, that's fine. I've never tried to use pattern inside of the uh, column operations here. So we're gonna need to specify them. So we got uh, PCT DES, oh, and let's go with that. Okay, so that's our iPads 2018. We're gonna need to keep in mind how we can possibly merge it with these other variables or these other data sets. Let's take a look at uh, 2019, see what that looks like. Let's look at our iPads 2019 data. So we want, uh, let's see, Weatherly College is private here. So as always, we're going to look directly at our data. Oh, so we have unit ID here and institution name. We could merge on that. Those could be our, our shared keys. And we want private status. So let's do a find here, private. Uh, control, institution, sector of institution, that could be, let's try it, let's, let's see what value sector has and see if that's going to give us what we want. So we use table to look at the different values of something. Um, actually, we, oh, the problem here is that it's numbered one to eight. We're not going to know what those numbers mean, except that it's labeled, Haven labeled. Uh, so you can actually label values as well. Uh, so we're going to use label table. From V tables, that's going to be iPads 2019. Let's see if sector, sector institution is sector. Here we go. Okay, so we have a bunch of different ones. Uh, so we have a couple of different privates. So we're going to need to create our private variable based on those values. So we got iPads 2019. We're going to do, uh, we only really need our merging variables. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and do an in, a non in place because I want to get rid of everything else. So I'm going to keep uh, unit ID, I'm going to keep institution name, and I'm going to do uh, private is if sector is in, what values do we have here? Two is private, five is private, and eight is private. Two, five, eight. There we go. 
Uh, we can probably get rid of everything else for iPads 2018 well as well. And then let's try a merge. Let's see what happens. Uh, so let's see if our merge works properly. So let's let's start working on our full data. It's going to merge everything together. We're going to do merge iPads 2018, iPads 2019. And let's do it by unit ID, institution name, and let's say let's just keep everything. All equals true. There we go. Seem to like that. One way that you can check how many failed merges you had, uh, if you try to do something like this, where we have all we've kept all the all the non missings, um, but uh, uh, we, we've kept we kept all the bad matches, um, but uh, uh, we might also want to know how many bad matches were there, right? So one thing you can do is take one of the variables that was only in one of the data sets but not the other, and check how many missings it has, uh, and that's one way that you can do it. Um, you can also do a version where all is set to false and see how, how different the rows are. But I can do something like this. I can say full data, uh, just give me the ones where is.na private. Were there any that we, that, that any, any in the 2018 that did not find a match in the 2019? And then give me n row, nothing. So everything has a, a non-missing value of private, which means that all of the 2018 schools found a 2019 match. So we know whether they're private or not. Does it go the other way? PCT, DESON. Okay, there were a couple schools that did not find a, a, a percentage of distance education. So that's good to know. So we have some missing data. Okay, so there's iPads. Uh, next, let's look at EADA. What does that actually look like? Also, which of these files do it has what we want? That's a good question. Okay. Oh, we got unit ID, institution name, looking good. These they probably got these from iPads, and we want to know uh, what's their classification. Classification name, division one, great. Uh, looks like we have classification codes as well. So two is a division one, one is a division one. So we're probably going to want to look at all these and see what values we have here. So schools are XLSX. We have an Excel file, so we need library read Excel. EADA, it's going to be read Excel, and that's going to be in the EADA folder, and then schools.xlsx. Oh, and we also want it to be as data table. There we go. Oh, what were those warnings? So let's read, let's read the error message or the warning message. So this is saying that it was expecting a logical value in a particular column, but it got a one instead. Uh, so that's just saying that it, it misunderstood one of the variable types, uh, which probably is not an issue unless that happens to be the variable type that we were interested in. So um, let's look at table EADA, and we want the classification code because we want to know what numbers we want and EADA classification name. Let's see what values we have there. Okay. So lots of different values. That's going to be too much work. I just want to know what numbers I want to pick out with division one in them. Um, so I can use some, uh, some string detection here to look for the words division one. Problem is that division two starts with division one. So we need to figure out a way to get around that. Um, maybe let's just instead drop all the division twos and threes and see what we get instead. So uh, I'm going to get my... Uh, Classification names. That's going to be EADA classification name. And I want you to give me just the unique values of that. So that's going to be all the different values that takes. Okay. And I want to get rid of all the division twos and threes. Okay. So class names, class names. Uh, let's see here. Not string detect. Class names. This is another string function. String detect just checks if a string is in there, gives you true if it is, false if it's not. Uh, division two. So this should get rid of all the division twos and the division threes, actually, because division three contains division two. 
Let's see if that worked. Always oh, see if it worked. Uh, yes, I do not see the division twos or threes now. So there's still some stuff in here that's not division one, but uh, uh, those are easier to get rid of. So now I just do want to get, I do want to get all the division ones. So these are all the different ways in which they say division one. So now I can look for those values, or I can just say this, um, EADA division one is going to be if the uh, classification name is in that list of class names that I found. There we go. So we got, uh, is it division one, this thing? No. Independent? No. Any NAIDA division one? Yes. NAIDA division two? No. So it seems like it's working properly. So uh, now we only need uh, our, in, our unit ID, institution name, and the division one, the EADA. And then that can also be part of our merge. I'm going to pipe onto another merge, EADA, by equals. Didn't like that. Why didn't it like that? Oh, because this didn't actually happen. Hi. Hi, I'm in the middle of my workshop. Oh, I structured. Sure. Okay. Sorry. Um, what was I doing? Oh, right. Okay. So it didn't have institution name. What is it called instead? EADA. Institution underscore name. Okay, so I'm going to set. I'm going to rename it. So as I mentioned, there's um, a bunch of set functions. Uh, you can also do renaming this way. So set names. EADA. I want to rename institution name to instnum, which is what it is in the iPads. So now when I do that, that'll work. And now when I do the merge, ah, this happens with the merges sometimes. So <laughs> we have the same variable on both sides of the merge, but it is currently stored as different types. Uh, so we need to fix the type. So what kind of types are we dealing with here? So class EADA, unit ID, it's a character in EIDA. How about in iPads? Class, uh, I guess iPads 2018. Okay, it's numeric over there. So I'm gonna wanna make them the same type so I can merge them. Which direction should I go? Any ideas about which, should I make the, the, num the number into a character or should I make the character into a number? Character into a number? Character into a number, yes. Because if there's any leading zeros, I want those to get dropped, right? Mm -hmm. If I go number to character and it's like one, two, three, four, and it's zero, one, two, three, four over here, it's still going to be one, two, three, four. They're not going to match up. So I'm going to go character to number. Uh, so it's character in EADA. So I'm going to do EADA, unit ID as numeric unit ID. We got it. All right, full data, great. Probably some missings, um, but uh, maybe not. I don't know, I'm not worried about it at this point. Okay, so we've got iPads, we've got EADA. Let's move on to the New York Times. Uh, so we have our county cases and let's see what we get, New York Times. Now this is a CSV file, so we're gonna use fread. Let's see what we got. So we have date, county, state, FIPS, cases and deaths. So none of these is unit ID or institution name. So we need some new merging variables if we're gonna merge. Um, and we want uh, county information on COVID cases on July 31st. So let's, let's limit this to July 31st. Date equals lubridate. July 31st. That worked. Yep, good. Okay, so we need, uh, we have information on county, we have information on state, we have FIPS information, which is just represent, representing the county and state. We need to get that from our data over here. So we didn't see that in EADA, but maybe let's reload our iPads and maybe it's going to be in some somewhere in there. So let's do V table. 
BT iPads. Oops, not that. 2018. Not 2018. 2019. There we go. Okay. Do we have anything about ah, FIPS state code? That's good. Uh, and it looks like it, but it's, it's only two digit, so that's not good. We need a full five digit FIPS code. County code, five digits. That's what we want. It also looks like it's a, it's a number. So it, it, it's dropped a leading zero here. If we look back at New York Times, it is also a number and it drops the leading zero. So they should be in the same format, so that's good. But we do need this, uh, this county code variable, it's county CD. Uh, county CD, oops, wrong one. Great. And then we notice it's called FIPS over here. I, I think I prefer that name to the county CD name. So we're going to rename it set names iPads 2019 uh, county CD. That's going to turn into FIPS. Let's reread that in, get that, change the name. And then it should just merge in. And then that will also give us the nice side effect of getting the name of the county and the name of the state in there, which aren't currently in there. Um, we get cases and deaths. So we're going to merge that. Didn't like it. OK, this is an error that you'll see sometimes with merges. Uh, so what this is finding is that um, check for duplicate p values. So remember the thing where I said you need to check if the observation level is unique? We have not done that, right? So it's finding combinations of the different things that we're merging, and it's giving us a bunch of results in result, in, 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 and we don't want that. So uh, let's see what is going wrong here. Um, so let's check uh, NYT FIPS duplicated max. Ah, we do have some duplicates. So uh, let's see what those are. So if I pass a, a actual data table to duplicate it, it will tell me which rows are duplicated. So I'm going to see what those rows are by passing that to the, uh, the row selector of NYT. So now it's just picking out rows that are duplicates uh, on the FIPS column. So what do we got here? Ah, it's FIPS that are missing. That is a common problem uh, that will give you problems with merging. So we're going to drop everybody who's missing a, uh, a FIPS, which looks like uh, some unknown counties that it doesn't have. New York City is not the name of a county, uh, which is why it doesn't have a FIPS code. Um, but we got a couple of things going on here. So let's do, fix that. So we got uh, NYT. Let's get rid of everything that's missing a FIPS. So we want NYT, just the parts that are not, uh, not missing. Uh, not in a FIPS. There we go. This should work. Class have to be again. Uh oh. Class NYT FIPS. Integer. Class if it's 2019 FIPS, double. So it doesn't like that they're different kinds of numbers. So let's convert the iPads 2019 FIPS to an integer. Didn't mean to mind that. Let's try this again. And there we go. Another one down. It looks like it lined up okay. I mean, we have some that are missing FIPS codes, so we, they didn't find a match. But you know, that'll happen. Okay. What's next? Uh, the census. So we have this right here, which you can have by county population. So hopefully, we should be able to merge uh, uh, just on the county uh, FIPS codes once we find out what's inside here. Census. And then what is this? This is a CSV file again. So we got FREED again. Let's see what this looks like. Okay. Ah, so we have some interesting things here. So for one, 
uh, notice that we had a uh, uh, this for the, the variable names are just v1, v2, v3, blah, 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 right? They're not the variable names that we want, which are clearly down here. So uh, we, we need to skip that first row. I think it's just skip, skip equals one. Let's try that again. There we go. It skipped. Oh, no, that wasn't enough. <laughs> Let's skip uh, to the first two. There we go. Oh, no, that's not right either. Hmm. Why doesn't it like that? I guess we should actually look at the file, huh? Okay, so if we skip this first one, it should just fill in these column names. So why is it not doing that? Check the documentation is always a good idea. So am I using skip wrong? Skips on the first line. Uh, skip a grade of the zero means ignore the first skip rows manually. Skip equals string search for string in the file. Starts on that line. Hmm. I don't know, but thankfully, we don't really, we can just ignore it. Uh, let's just skip those first two because what that was doing was, no. Oh, Could that row be merged, possibly? Um, well, the problem is that it's it's reading everything in as uh, strings, I think. Oh, well, maybe it's not. Yeah, everything's a string. OK. So I don't know why it's doing this weird thing, uh, but let's just roll with it. So we have this. It's got our variable names in the first row as opposed to in the variable name section. So uh, we're just going to get rid of that row after we figure out what uh, columns we want. So uh, we want census. And I want the county here. It looks like we're going to have to work with the county name. Uh, and we want the 2019 population, which is V13. So we want census. Uh, V1 and V13. Cool. Okay. So I want to set names, census, uh, and let's change both names, V1 and V13. And that's going to get recalled into county name and uh, population 2019. Great. Now I don't need that first row anymore. So census. Census um, two to n row census, getting rid of that first row. Great. Now I need to turn these into numbers because they're characters. And I wonder if it'll just work if I do it. Let's try it out. I don't think it will. Yeah, and he's introduced by course. That's usually a bad sign when you're doing a number conversion. Yeah, it made everything in it. So let's try that again. Uh, so let's do our string replace trick. So census pop 2019 string replace all pop 2019. Get rid of all those commas, turn them into nothing, and then convert to a number. That didn't give us any problems. There's our numbers. Okay, so uh, now we're going to need to merge on the county name, and I spot a problem which is that this county name is stored weird. It's got a dot, then the county name, then the word county, then a comma, then Alabama, then the state. Whereas in the other data that we are working with, it is uh, just the county name without the word county and the state, and also there's no period. So the first thing we need to do is get rid of that period. Uh, so let's do that. So now we're gonna to have to do some string manipulation. So census, uh, county name. Uh, so I don't know necessarily whether the period is there in every single row, but let's just so let's just manipulate it if there is one. So let's check. So string. Uh, so if string sub of county name 
one one. So I'm looking at the first character of that variable. If that's a period, then I want you to manipulate things. String sub county name to to the end, right? So what this is saying is, if the first character is, character is a period, get rid of it. That seemed to work. Okay, cool. Now, we have the problem that we have the county name and the word county and then the state. Uh, and we need one question to... yep. on the, on the um, that one, <laughs> this string sum. Is it removing the period or is it just ignoring the first character and looking at characters? It's removing the first character, but it's only doing it if that first character is a period. So it is like deleting it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because okay. I did an in-place manipulation here. Gotcha. Okay. So first thing we need to do is we're going to separate out the county name from the state name. That's easy enough. We'd have string split for that. So uh, uh, we've got census and I want, what are the names here? County and state. So I want to create county and state and that's going to be string split county name and we're going to split on the comma. Oh Lord. Yeah, this whole thing of assigning multiple columns at once with the in place sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. I don't understand the why of sometimes doesn't, doesn't. Oh, Lord, that's annoying. Okay, so what we're going to do instead is this. We're going to create them separately. Uh, so we're going to say county. It's going to be string sub county name. And we're going to go from the start up to string, uh, what is it, locate, string locate, up a comma, and minus one. So I think if I do this, if this is correct, this should start at the first character of the string. It should go until it finds a comma, comma, back up by one, and then that's where it's going to end. Let's see if that works. Did not. Oh, I did not give it a string to look for here, county name. Didn't like that either. Uh, I think it might be because county name might not just give us back a number. Uh, oh yeah, it does that. So we want just the first element of that. That might work. So why did it? Well, I'll come right there. Oh, it's giving me the same length for each of them. It's just looking at the first uh, row there. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to construct this outside of data table. We can put it in later. So uh, just county. We're going to start with county name. Sometimes it can be easier to take things out of data table, uh, especially if you want to do some things if you want it to not confuse variable names with other things, sometimes you can you might want to do that. So we're going to take it outside of the table. Um, we're going to find the location of uh, where the comma is in each of those. So comma loc, it's going to be just county or string locate, just county, comma. And I think I just want the first column of that. Did that work? No. Oh, because I'm asking for the first row, not the first column. I think that might do it. That did it. There we go. Yeah. So I was, I was, I was, because uh, string locate gives me this whole matrix thing. I just put in one, which gave me the first row. And so it made every string 15 characters long, as opposed to the first column, which goes all the way down. And so on. Okay. We figured it out. See, a lot of this is just muddling. Okay, so we have that. We want to get rid of the word county because uh, that is not in the other one. So census, county, string, replace, all, county, county, nothing. Great. And then uh, let's trim it. Okay, and we want to check our work uh, just to make sure that it did what we think it did. This is short enough, we can just look at it. 
So we should just see, ah, uh, ooh, ah. See here, here we have some problems, All right? So these things did not have counties. These are, these are boroughs and not counties. Uh, do we got anything else? DC seems fine. Okay, so we got to keep in mind that we got some things that are boroughs, so that those might not line up. We'll see what happens when we when we try to merge. Maybe they're also the same in the other data. Okay, so we got that. Uh, then we got to get a state. Do the same thing here, except we're going to go in the other direction. We're going to start with the place of the where the comma is. Plus one, and then go to the end, and that should work. There we go. That seems to have worked, and let's trim it just in case. Great. Okay, now let's try to merge it. See what happens. This is the last thing we'll do, uh, and then the rest of the walkthrough I will leave uh, in your hands. Uh, so we're going to merge uh, with census by county and state. Oh, let's get rid of county name. We don't need that anymore. And let's do all equals true. And let's see what happens. So it worked without error. That's good. Uh, let's see how well things lined up. Let's just take a look at what we have. So, okay. So we certainly had some merges here, which is good. Uh, we have the population filled in. Let's see uh, what our data looks like for if, if it's if it's missing population, if it didn't find a merge in the population in the census data. So full data. Let's just look at the uh, is.na pop 2019. Okay, so there's a lot of them. Uh, let's look at them more closely with view. You can use view, by the way, just look at part of a data set. Um, you can't, which you can't do by just clicking over here. If you want to look at just part of a data set in a spreadsheet format, you use view. Okay, so um, if these are all missing FIPS, then that just means that we are not matching them because we don't know where they are, which I guess we can't get around that. There's some missing data there. Um, oh, but not always. Let's see here. So we have FIPS 36005. Ah, so this, uh, I'm gonna guess this does not have deaths either. So this was some data that was not in the New York Times data, which is why we don't have county and state names for it, uh, which is why we weren't able to match it with the census data. So we know why we weren't able to match it. Um, let's, I mean, we might when consider at this point, what, is there some other way we can match? Is there something else we can do? Um, for now, let's just make sure that that is why they're not matching. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, what should be the case is if it's not matching because it either didn't have FIPS or it wasn't able to match in the New York Times data is everything that's missing POP 2019 should also be missing the deaths variable. Okay, so let's check that. So we're gonna do um, full data, just the ones that are missing uh, POP 2019. Okay, and then we're gonna get the deaths variable. And then we're gonna check uh, is.na for each of them. And then take the average. And this should be one. It should be that every single one that is missing pop 19 is also missing deaths. Let's see what happens. It's not. So there are some that did have deaths, but did not match up with uh, population. Let's take a look at that. Full data is .na pop 2019 and is not na deaths. Okay. So we got Louisiana. We got Puerto Rico. We got Alaska. Uh, okay. And we got Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico makes sense. Uh, they might not have counties in the same way. Um, if we look back at the census data, let's take a look at the census data for Alaska. Ah, that was where our boroughs were coming into place. All right, uh, so that's gonna be a problem. Let's look at Louisiana. And now we got parishes. So if we were to continue doing this, our next step would be to get rid of the words parish and borough and see what we needed to do to line up those names so that they would match, merge properly. Uh, once we did that, hopefully we would have merged all the census data we possibly could merge. Uh, and then we would be moving on to getting the uh, political data stuff in there, which would require us to get the... Uh, the congressional districts, which is also in the United States. All right, any any questions about this?
All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Hopefully you uh, try out data table and find it useful uh, as I do. Um, and I will be posting this video again, email me if you want me to, if, if you haven't already signed up to, to receive the email uh, videos, then do let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you so much. much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.